Welcome to the Comic Story and Channel, where we take some of your favorite pop culture universes and we take the lore within them, or the comic books, or the movies, and we break them down into a synopsis. We give you an audio drama of your favorite story for you to enjoy at your leisure. Now, on this channel, we make a lot, a lot of videos. There's actually over 2,000 on this channel at this point. And that means that some of our storylines have gotten lost over the years. So every Monday, we put together what is known as a full story. This is videos that have come out over the course of two years, three years, meaning that our quality has improved, our voiceovers have improved, our just everything we do has improved, but we do these videos to make it easier for you to watch some of the older content. And today, we're going to tell you the story of Grayson and Nightwing Rebirth. Now, a quick recap. We're gonna give you the origin of Dick Grayson, how he became Robin. Then during the Forever Evil event, Dick Grayson was seemingly killed and his identity revealed to the world. Everyone knew who Dick Grayson was, that he was in fact Nightwing. So he wasn't able to become Nightwing anymore. So the storyline we're gonna tell you after that is during his brief period as a secret agent in which it was basically Spiral. He went to work for Spiral as a secret agent. That is the Grayson storyline. We're gonna tell you that one. When that wraps up, we're gonna tell you the initial storyline to Nightwing Rebirth known as better than Batman. So that's what you're getting today. You're getting a full Nightwing Dick Grayson storyline from beginning to end, from him becoming a secret agent to redeeming himself as Nightwing. I hope you guys enjoy. And if you do, make sure you go check us out on Twitter at Comicstorian. If you want to help us and help our channel, then please consider commenting down below as that really does help us more than you know, and going to our Twitter and just chatting with us because we're trying to build up the Twitter brand. Anyway, let's get on with that full story. Richard Dick Grayson had two loving parents, and he himself was the model child. Loving, caring, and when it was his mother's birthday, he even picked out the best gift for her. But of course, he wouldn't tell his father. It needed to be a secret to both of them. You see, the Graysons were a well-known circus act in the Haley Circus, so Richard's days were filled with fun and excitement. And on the night of his mother's birthday, Richard sat outside of his parents' trailer, and he listened as his mother opened the gift. It was a golden bracelet with two robins kissing on it. It was perfect, and she loved it. He just sat outside the trailer smiling as he heard them talking about how perfect of a gift it was. But that night, tragedy struck for Richard as it does with most superheroes. The circus was tapped on funding, and because of this, they skimped on the safety precautions. Both of Richard's parents fell to their deaths in front of the entire audience, and in front of Richard himself. And the audience, though, was Bruce Wayne, and he saw the terror in the young boy's eyes as his entire life washed away that day. So he took a special interest in Richard that day, and he followed him for the next two weeks. The death of his parents was placed on a man who failed to properly set up the safety precautions, and Richard went on a warpath looking for that man, the man named Tony Zuko. But Batman watched from a distance as a young Richard ran in risking his life to get his revenge, and on one night in which Richard would have received a bullet to the head, Batman leaped in to rescue him. He then brought Richard to the Batcave that night, and Richard put it together. Batman hadn't been following Zuko. He had been following Richard to protect him. And Batman didn't deny it. As a matter of fact, he removed his cowl, revealing to Richard that he was Bruce Wayne. He then offered to help train Richard to fight against Zuko, to turn his rage into a true passion and something that could protect Gotham City. So they spent the next few months turning the acrobat Richard Grayson into the superhero sidekick of Batman. And on one fall evening, Bruce Wayne walked over and he saw Richard doodling designs for his costume. But Bruce agreed that the designs that Richard had drawn didn't work. They didn't speak to him as a person. And that's when Richard saw two Robins flying nearby. Bruce told him, the Robin is a sign of hope and rebirth in some cultures, almost a sign of growing up. So with that, Robin was born, and he went on to fight with Batman in many battles, and he became one of the strongest allies Batman has ever had. And on the anniversary of his parents' death, he decided he wanted to remember them, but he wasn't sure how. It was Alfred Pennyworth that recommended that he remember them by living up to his namesake, the Robin. So every year on the anniversary of his parents' death, he lives his life to the fullest, to remember the good times. Alfred is preparing to take some tea down to Bruce, and he heads over to the elevator that leads to the Batcave. 
He looks at a picture of Dick and Bruce, and he reminisces about it. Was it really that long ago, Master Dick? It doesn't seem like it was. As he gets into the elevator, and he begins to try and call it, he says to himself that they've lost too many. First Damien, and now Dick. It's just, it's enough. And then he stands there for a moment before he realizes that the elevator isn't moving. So Alfred calls Bruce over the intercom and he informs him of his predicament, to which Bruce simply responds, It's okay, Alfred. The cave is having some issues and the cameras are down too. Go ahead and go back to the mansion. I'll be fine in here. I'll fix it. But before Alfred goes, he expresses his worry about Bruce, with Master Richard's passing, with the boy's passing. He just wants to make sure that Bruce is okay. Dick Grayson was almost a son to Bruce Wayne, or as close as he had until Damien. And Bruce responds by informing Alfred that Dick wasn't a boy. He was never a boy. To which Alfred just says, of course. And he heads back to the mansion. Down in the Batcave, Batman and Nightwing appear to be preparing for a sparring match. Batman says, how many times have we done this? How many rules have I given you? Where you fight, how you fight, we've done this too many times, he continues. I need to see if they broke you. I need to see if you still have the heart that you once had. So one more time, Dick. Only one rule. You need to win. So Batman and Nightwing go at it. They start this fight like they've done so many times before. Two men, almost equals. The fight encompasses the whole cave, destroying everything around them. And Batman says, You let them take you. You let them reveal your secret. And Nightwing just responds, You weren't there. But Batman continues, You let them turn you into a bomb and kill you. Before Luther revived you, you let everyone watch you die. As the fight continues, Batman just states, I've trained you too long and watched you die. And then he hits Nightwing in the face. After that, I need to know if you're strong enough to know what comes next. Are you strong enough to make sacrifices that we will all have to make? And Nightwing just responds with, What is this, Bruce? So their fight continues, and Batman just says, I have a special mission for you, Dick. I need you to do something that'll hurt your friends, your family, and even me. I need you to stay dead. And Nightwing just stares shocked. No! And he kicks Batman into the air. Batman smiles and simply says, Good. Fight. Fight like you can't be captured. Like you can't be killed. Fight like you're alive. And then as Batman throws a giant dice at Nightwing's head, knocking him off balance, he says, Spiral, the espionage group. They fight the usual evils in the world. A lot of people fight that fight. Spiral is the best. But before Batman can go any further, Nightwing interjects, But Tim, Jason, Alfred, Barbara! But Batman just keeps going. A lot of people fight that fight. Spiral is the best. I know this because of how long it took me to figure out that they were doing everything behind my back. And Nightwing just states, I can't. They're my family, Bruce. Our family. But Batman just keeps going. They're hunting masked heroes. They want our identities. Who we hate, who we love. As he smashes Nightwing into the bat boat. And Nightwing adds, after Damien, I can't do this to them. I just can't. But Batman just keeps going. We can't let them do this. You can't let them do this. But Nightwing continues to argue. I'm alive, Bruce. I'm alive. And Batman responds with one word. Good. As Nightwing tosses them both off of the catwalk and onto the classic Batmobile. Nightwing just says, How can you ask me to do this? Me. And Batman responds with, If they know our secrets, we can't fight. How many people will die if we can't fight? We need an inside man. We need you, Dick. They'll come for you. A masked man without a mask. Batman just asks one more question. Why do we fall, Dick? So that we can learn and get back up. But Nightwing just says, no. And he peels off his mask. No, that's not true. We fall because someone pushes us. And Dick Grayson stands back up as he finishes. We get back up so we can push back. As their fight comes to its end, Batman says to Dick that he's the only one who can do this. None of the other heroes have this in them. Spiral would just use them to get to the rest. And Batman finishes. I know I'm hurting the family, but this has to be done. And Dick responds yelling, After this, it'll never be the same. Between us, it can't be the same. And then they exchange a few of their final blows, with Dick just saying, I'm not a boy. Bruce falls to the ground, finally taking his cowl off. And he says, that's enough. And Dick responds with, no, it's never enough. Finishing his statement with, one rule, I win. Bruce responds with the final word, 
good, bringing the fight to a close. From there, Dick Grayson went to go work for the agency known as Spiral as Grayson. Spiral is trying to find every superhero's secrets out so he can use them against them. But Grayson is there to be the inside man and keep this from happening. Dick Grayson was an amazing acrobat, one of the Flying Graysons, until his parents were murdered. But Batman helped him find new purpose as Robin, arguably the best Robin that there was. But he outgrew that role. He needed to become something more. So he became Nightwing, the hero of Bloodhaven, and practically a brother to Bruce Wayne. But he outgrew that role as well. Or he died, rather. When the crime syndicate arrived on Earth in their Forever Evil storyline, they unmasked Dick Grayson on national television. And then they murdered him for all to see. Batman did revive him. But where does an unmasked superhero go? He goes undercover into a spy organization that is trying to get the identities of all of the superheroes. The organization is Spiral, and Dick Grayson is now known as Agent 37, and he's joined their ranks to find out what their true purpose is, and keep Batman informed. Now Grayson is on the Trans-Siberian Railway in a blonde wig. He somersaults onto the top of the train car, and he finds himself jumped by one of the thugs who was also on the roof. He struggles for a second, but then he gets the gun out of the thug's hands, and he throws it against a nearby pole, ricocheting it back into the thug's head. He sighs to himself as he handcuffs the thug to the roof. The downside to this solo act is that no one's around to see you do cool stuff. But little does he know that Midnighter is watching from a distance. Damn, that was pretty cool. Grayson lands inside of the train car and he talks his way out of needing a ticket before entering the dining car and having a seat at the bar. Next to him is a gorgeous blonde hitting on an older, fatter Russian gentleman. The older Russian gentleman's name is Niall and he's Grayson's mark. The blonde woman would be from a competing agency also trying to get their hands on this mark. So Grayson accidentally spills his drink onto the woman's chest, forcing her to leave the bar to get cleaned up. The woman walks away grumbling to herself before feeling dizzy as she looks up at another woman standing over the bar. Grayson's partner, Helena, is looking at the woman. Don't worry, it's a paralytic agent that was spilled onto your ample chest. Who are you? Checkmate? Shut up and enjoy the scenery, Helena tells her. While Helena is talking to the blonde bombshell, Grayson manages to slip a roofie into the Russian man's drink and is currently carrying him out of the train car onto the side of the train, and then he jumps off of the train and off of the nearby bridge with the man in tow. But the thugs begin to immediately fire upon him. Grayson radios to Helena, We're taking fire! Do something, Agent 37. Or do I need to remind you what can happen if you breach his containment field? So Grayson thinks quickly, and he uses an implant that Spiral gave him, known as Hypnos, to hack into the Russian man's mind and implant a suggestion. I'm your friend. You've been lonely and afraid for so long, I just want to help you. Yes, help you, friend! So the two men run to a nearby nuclear silo with the enemy agent still shooting at them. They get all the way to the silo and they hide inside, but once they get inside, the Russian man passes out as something has hit him, and Grayson finds himself being assaulted by Midnighter! They bounce off the walls and the catwalks of the facility, with Grayson getting a left hook in and Midnighter headbutting him. So Grayson uses his Hypnos implant again on Midnighter, and Midnighter immediately knows what this means. A Hypno implant? That means you're Spiral, and you aren't here to help the poor sap at all. You're here to exploit him. But before Midnighter can say or do anything, he's blasted through the wall of the silo and into the sky. Grayson turns to his Russian friend standing there. I help you. It's what friends do. You're burning up. I need you to vent. Is it true what men said? You just want to use me? Yes, it is. I'm just like the men who asked you to smuggle what's inside of you. I'm not your friend. You're a loser that I know I can manipulate. And the Russian man blasts the wall trying to hurt Grayson. But he cartwheels out of the way and lets the man blast away again while he continues to dodge. Until finally, he burns out and collapses to the ground. Grayson has Helena come by for the extraction. They both come in for their debriefing where the head of Spiral congratulates them for an incredible job well done. And that night, while he's trying to call in to Mr. Malone, aka Batman, Grayson gets a visitor. Helena just wanted to spend some quality time with him. But he stops her. Isn't this forbidden by Spiral? I know that. I just wanted to see if I could get away with it with you without using Hypnos. Good night, Agent 37.
Our story opens up on Helena training the newest set of recruits at the St. Hardin's Finishing School. Today's lesson is how to fire a crossbow into the head of an enemy. When out stumbles the hood, one of Spiral's many agents. As he collapses on the ground, he cracks a joke that Matron Bertinelli looks lovely today. Meanwhile, Batman is busy battling against the Cycles of Violence, a low-level biking gang. Mr. Malone, this is Birdwatcher. This line is secure. Is this a bad time? Batman tells him to hold on while he jumps over the biker, kicking him off the bike and forcing it to crash. Are you safe, Birdwatcher? I'd say I'm pretty good for a dead man. How's Gotham? Chaotic, insane, beautiful. And your funeral was nice. How did Al, the butler, take it? In Red Riding Hood? Birdwatcher, dick. The longer we stay in this line, the more likely they'll intercept it. Yeah, you're right. I don't need to know. I'm gonna wrap this up before the flowers in my grave wilt. Birdwatcher out. He then steps out of his room and he walks off to his mission briefing with Helena, his partner. They enter the head office and Mr. Minos explains that Agent 24, also known as the Hood, has returned. He was tracking a black market meta bioweapon, an enhanced stomach. Mr. Minos wants Grayson and Helena to pick up where this mission left off. And of course, they get to use the Spiral Mobile. They head off into the rain in their Spiral Mobile, which is a rather tiny car that Grayson got to take a great nap in. Helena will go report on the missing sheep in the area while Grayson heads off to chat up with the locals in the pubs and see where that can get him. It's quite obvious who did better though because three hours later we find Grayson taking a series of blows to his body from a speedster. As they run off shouting, sorry human tenderize, Grayson thinks fast throwing a flashbang at the wall and then shooting it with his gun. The flash distracts the speedster and drops her to the ground. She pulls off her glove and looks at her hand and sees wrinkles starting to form. So she panics and boom, she runs off shouting, no! Helena runs down into the tunnels because she heard a shot. And she says that she found all of the sheep gnawed to the bone and shoved into a cave. So Grayson explains that this girl picked him out of a crowd and brought him down here where their fight began. They walk deeper into these tunnels and they find a training facility placed into a bomb shelter. And they also find human bones. And Grayson and Helena put it together that this girl has been eating people down here in the basement. But before they can continue their discussion, Grayson shoves Helena to the ground as the speedster has returned. Grayson throws another flashbang against the wall, distracting her. And the girl explains that she's doing this because she saw so many horrific things working for the group, they. She didn't want to do this. But she didn't have the time to find somebody to test this properly. So she put it into herself, and the faster that she moves, the faster she ages. She then whips up a storm, throwing both Grayson and Helena to the ground, as she takes a bite out of Grayson's arm. There was never enough food. I was always hungry. Grayson tries to kick and punch, but he can't get at her. He just can't do it. She moves too fast. But Helena tells him to stand down. What? Why? Because Spiral can use her. We're going to offer her a job and not risk damaging the implant. Wait, what? She's a cannibal. She killed people. She ate them. She's not a supervillain, Agent 37. Your old superhero days are over. She's an asset to Spiral. Grayson and Helena stare each other down. And then she throws a punch at him. Oh, come on. You didn't think I saw that coming? I can read your mind, Helena. So Helena leans in and says a trigger phrase, deactivating Grayson's hypno implants and knocking him out. The metahuman was brought in and the organ removed, stopping her speed and metabolism. And Helena didn't report Grayson's insubordination to their leader. While not happy with what happened, Grayson will have to deal with it while he remains undercover. And as we go to the secret offices of Mr. Milo, we get a better scope of Spiral's plans. He's trying to build metahumans equal to other superheroes. With the part that they gained on his last mission, Grayson on board with Spiral and this new enhanced stomach, he now has a Batman, Cyborg, and a Flash. Our story begins with us looking down the barrel of a gun. The man that we are looking at is Barton Tarr, and he has another enhanced organ the Spiral is trying to get his hands on, enhanced eyes. But since we're looking down the barrel of a gun, we know that this doesn't end well as the assassin, the Old Gun, kills Barton and takes the eyes. Old Gun has no eyes of his own, and he was hoping to put them into his own head. But instead of eyes, the sockets where his eyes should be are linked to the barrels of his guns. What the guns see, he can see. So Agent 37, also known as Grayson and his partner Matron, are tasked with retrieving the enhanced eyes. But due to the importance of this mission, and just how fragile the package is, they'll have additional partners, Agent 1 and Agent 8. After Grayson gets a little close to Agent 8, all four head off to their mission. So Grayson walks into the restroom with Old Gun draining his lizard next to him. And then he turns to Old Gun and tells him, Looks like you're about done. You got a problem, pal? No problem. 
And with that, Grayson grabs his line and tackles the old gun, pushing them both of the nearby window and out of the building. Grayson smiles as he sees that his line is attached to a helicopter nearby, being piloted by Matron. And he already has their target. Looks like it'll be a fast and easy mission. But Old Gun uses his guns to shoot the line, dropping them both to the nearby rooftop. As they both recover, Agent 8 takes a sniper shot at Old Gun, clipping him in the neck. So he spins around and fires a gun at her, and then one at the helicopter, damaging it. With the helicopter going down into a burning wreck and Matron bailing out, Grayson pulls his gun on Old Gun. But Grayson has been trained to never use a gun by Batman, never kill an enemy, regardless of what Spiral wants him to do. Please, I don't want to do this. Think about your boys. Haven't the guns done enough? And Grayson lowers his gun slowly, but Old Gun doesn't lower his until he gets hit in the neck by Agent One. Dick Grayson, you're an idiot. The two of them escape the area with the authorities coming, and Old Gun also escapes. And back at the base, Agent 8 slaps Grayson for not taking the shot. What kind of an agent lowers his gun? Spiral doesn't care about his previous life. Nightwing, Wing Knight, or some bird, whatever he was. He's Agent 37 now, and they need him on point. You're all like Batman, she exclaims. Little boys under little masks, crying about their dead mommies. So Grayson calls up Mr. Malone, or Batman as he's better known on their secure line, and she informs Batman that Agent 8 knows his identity along with the rest of Spiral, and then he asks for any information on this old gun guy so that he can track him down. And Batman tells Grayson that the old gun's real name is Christoph Tanner, and he has a son enrolled in preschool that's starting this fall. Realizing that this is the reason the old gun wanted his new set of eyes, Grayson goes to the school alone where he easily finds Old Gun on the roof looking down at his son through the barrels of his gun. He approaches him and he tells him that his son is going to be in class 118 in Miss Santa Lou's room. Old Gun then turns his guns to Grayson. I get it, guns make things go faster, but what's the rush? Grayson says, not even ready to defend himself. So Old Gun lowers the pistols. He then throws Grayson the box with the enhanced eyes. The doctor said they won't work for me, so here take them. Before we do what we gotta do, can I meet my kid? Sure. Go for it. But that's when a bullet hits Old Gun, dropping him. Grayson screams out, No! And over his radio, he hears Agent 8 and Agent 1 report in. They followed Grayson. They congratulate him for a job well done. Though next time, he should get the entire team involved. But Old Gun isn't dead, and he turns to where the shot came from, and he shoots Agent 8 in the head, with Grayson once again screaming, No! Old Gun then falls dead into the schoolyard in front of his own son, and Agent 8 falls down onto the roof dead. Grayson takes a seat on the roof as Agent 1 comes over the radio. Agent 37, do you have eyes on Agent 8? She isn't reporting in. Agent 37, are you there? Agent 37! And Grayson, with a very stern look, just responds, That's not my name. Back at Spiral Headquarters, Mr. Midas calls in Matron to report that he's getting a pirated signal. Someone is making encrypted calls from their base. And she needs to find out who it is. This operation to gain the powers of superheroes can't be compromised. Fire burns from the back of the plane as Grayson and Midnighter argue over a dying woman giving birth. What are you doing? You said that if I didn't throw you off this aircraft, you could save her. I'm not the one who kidnapped her, Spiral. Yeah, you're the one who led Argus to us, and you got us shot down. That's when Helena from the pilot seat chimes in. The Argus EMP hit everything. Not only are our engines down, but all of our systems aren't responding. So are you gonna help her or not, Midnighter? Shut up, Grayson. I have the head. Just hold her still. Grayson looks down at the poor woman, worried. He knows this isn't going to end well, and the fact that they're going down isn't helping the situation. As smoke fills the air around them, Midnighter tells the woman to push. He can get the baby still. Then that's when the ship hits the ground, hard, and Grayson realizes how this story is going to play out. No, 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 I'm losing the mother, I'm losing the mother! No! As they take into account all of the supplies that they have, Grayson is holding the crying baby. Helena tells them the bad news. The closest town is 200 miles south of their position, across the empty quarter, a desert with a hot and blazing sun. We're dead, Midnighter says, comforting. We're not dead, Grayson tells him. I found formula and bottles in the mother's things, plus we have some water and a few MREs, Helena tells the group. It's not enough. We're dead, Midnighter says, once again reassuring his group. If we're dead, she's dead, Grayson says, looking down at the baby. So we're not dead. We walk. And he starts the trek across the desert. Day one, there isn't any talking, but as the sun beats down on our heroes, Midnighter does drop his leather jacket. Then Helena hits the ground, and he goes to help her up, discovering that she was injured in the plane crash. 
Day two, Helena's injury starts to get worse and they are already hitting the end of their water supply. But Grayson won't give up. This child has to make it. That night, over their campfire, Midnighter explains the situation. The child has the heart. It's full of energy. Spiral and Midnighter have been looking for metahuman enhancing organs for their respective organizations. This child has the one that they all came for, a metahuman enhanced heart. Grayson and Helena's mission is to get the child back to Spiral. But as Midnighter tells him, give me the child. With that energy, we can survive this and we can make it all the way back. Give it to me or I'll take it from you and I'll win. I can see what's coming, remember? I can fight with your style, Midnighter tells Grayson. But Grayson ignores him. That's when Helena takes a knife to his throat. Yeah? Did you see that coming? Grayson just sits there holding the child. Shh, baby girl. Day three, Helena's injury gets the better of her, and she falls down in the desert. Grayson runs over and he tries to give Helena the water, but she stops him. The water is for the baby. Promise me that that water will only go to the baby, she says. We went for her. We took her. It's all her. You have to get her back, Dick. So Grayson takes his shirt off and he pitches a tent for Helena, allowing Grayson and Midnighter to continue on. As the sun begins to set, Midnighter taunts Grayson once again. You think you're so high and mighty saving that child? What do you think Spiral's gonna do with that child when you bring her back? You don't think they'll let her keep the heart, do you, Grayson? Grayson spins around and cold clocks Midnighter. Hurry up, there's a lot ahead and you're slowing us down. Day five is just Midnighter taunting Grayson. We should fight and Grayson ignoring him. Day six is Midnighter continuing. We should fight so I can win and take the baby. Day seven, even Midnighter is getting tired of himself. We should, we should. And he falls in the desert. Dick Grayson, I have enhancements, I have powers. What do you have? And Grayson leaves the water for Midnighter. I have her. As of day eight, it's only Grayson and the child. And he tells a story, a story about his dreams as a child. Day nine, he keeps telling that story but he is finally beginning to lose himself to the heat. And day 10? Well, day 10, Grayson went as far as he could, and he collapsed, holding the baby up still. That's when a nice couple happened across him. He made it. He was rescued, and so was the child. A week later, back at Spiral, Grayson and Helena were still in recovery, and the head of Spiral was going over the report. He was sad that they lost the heart. Supposedly, it was lost in the crash, and it's unrecoverable. Oh well, on to the next enhanced organ. But the truth is, the child is fine, being raised by a loving family elsewhere, and the heart is still with that child. Our tale begins with Grayson and Helena making their way across the coastline of the Yellow Sea, moving towards the base of a group called AWOL. They are a collection of deserters from various criminal organizations pulling heists for personal gain. But as they get closer, a giant killer whale attacks them. Orca, Grayson shouts out, pulling Helena out of its path. But then he sees what he's actually fighting. Let me modify that, zombie orca with legs. Helena explains that they are actually security nanosites and they're attached to whatever is nearby when they lack a human host. Grayson hits it with a bolt from his crossbow and he watches it fall into the ocean. Return to the ocean and swim free, Willy. The two of them come over the ridge and in the base of the group AWOL, where they see everyone as dead. Grayson walks through shutting the eyes of the dead soldiers in shock at what's happened to them. And he asks what this brain does that could cause this to happen. Helena tells him that they don't know what the brain does, just whispers and rumors about its abilities. But off in the distance, Midnighter is watching them. And while he can't see their faces because of their spiral hypnos devices, he does know Grayson's ass anywhere. Helena takes one of the few survivors as she begins to dig around in his head using her hypnose to search his mind for answers. That's when Grayson gets too close to the technology allowing Midnighter to stay hidden and Midnighter reaches out grabbing him. Hey you dick! What Midnighter did was pull Grayson through a door to the God Garden, Midnighter's base of operations. He explains that this is where everything man-made gets hidden and then he lunges at Grayson. You got in my way in Russia and again in the empty quarter and I'm the kind of guy that holds grudges. I'm on a mission and I don't have time for you, you goth club bouncer, Grayson replies as he jumps into the air and throws a baton at Midnighter. Midnighter catches it and replies, that's funny, I was on a mission too, to keep superhuman organs out of the hands of a spy organization called Spiral. They go back and forth trading blows and quips, with Midnighter starting to win as he studied Nightwing's moves. But that's when Grayson begins to win and he asks him, did you study Robin's moves? He gets the better of Midnighter, but that's when his eye begins to bleed as his hypnose begins to fail. 
Oh yeah, forgot to mention. The God Garden has tech that turns off that wet work stuff. And then he knocks Grayson out. Or it allows me to install it. As he has now seemingly taken Grayson's Hypno's tech. Back with Helena, she's finally figured out what's going on. The Fist of Cain has taken the Paragon Brain. They plan to fill it with hate and anger until it's ready to explode and then launch a psychic attack on the nearby peace rally. Meanwhile, back with Grayson, he's trying his best to overcome Midnighter, but he has the moves and the tech now. And once he knocks out Grayson, he'll use the Hypnos to trace the signal back to the spiral base. So Grayson says the secret word and disrupts the Hypnos that Midnighter took out of him. Using that disruption, he uppercuts Midnighter, knocking him out finally. That's when an old woman appears behind Grayson. She asks him to follow her and apologizes for Midnighter's actions. It was unattended and his temperament got the better of him. But now, she'll need Grayson's help in stopping the Fist of Cain. Because they've been built to destroy the God Garden. To destroy her, the Gardener. And Grayson is going to be needed to save the God Garden. With Helena moving towards Israel to stop this, she has Mr. Minos patch into Grayson's Hypnos so that she can see where her partner has vanished off to. And what she sees is Grayson locked in a cell in front of her. Which means that someone else is using the Hypnos. And when he gets close to the glass, she sees that it's Midnighter. So she has an idea to link up Grayson's implant, which is in Midnighter with her implant, so that she can show Midnighter what's about to happen and get him on board. Because he's the only one that can save Grayson now. Meanwhile, Grayson is trying his best to convince the gardener to let him out of the cell. But the gardener explains that she wants thousands to die in Israel. It'll show the world that this artificial superhuman arms race needs to end now. God Garden wants to unleash this flood to combat sin. But at that moment, Midnighter's brain overloads as his hypnosis is getting all of the information from Helena. He hits the ground and blood begins to pour out of his eye. But he does manage to get out the order. God Garden, release Grayson, open the door, we need to stop Israel. He turns around to the door and shouts, Gardener, you have to let me go, I saw things, and I think Grayson is telling the truth. But while Midnighter is now on his side, Grayson is trying his best to convince the Gardener as well, telling her that he saw the refugees that she saved, that she has compassion, why is she keeping him here? And Midnighter walks to the door begging the Gardener to release Grayson. He doesn't want to fight her, please let him help. Meanwhile, in Israel with Helena, a concert is blaring loud music and the singer holds up the Paragon Brain. And thoughts of hatred, murder, and death pour into the people of Israel. And they begin tearing people apart. The Gardener is finally convinced and Midnighter and Grayson walk through one of the many doorways from the God Garden and into Israel, ready to stop all of these people. Midnighter takes crowd duty while Grayson leaps over the people fighting and makes a break for the brain. But just as he gets close, he sees Helena coming for him as she's been affected by the device, shouting, Agent 37, you abandoned me, you left me, I hate you, I'll kill you. He pushes her back as she reaches in to kiss a surprised Grayson. There, that cleared my mind, she tells him, I'll disarm the crowd, get the brain. Even more confused, Grayson jumps back in. Sure, I'll keep uh, clean thoughts going. He jumps back onto the stage and he kicks a knife away that Midnighter tried to throw, telling him, no one gets killed. And then he begins to drop the leader and his goons on the stage one at a time. But while that's going on, Helena finds herself overwhelmed. And that's when the director of Spiral appears in front of her, shooting the man off of her. She just surprisingly asks, Director Minos? Back on stage, Grayson gets ready to smash the device holding the brain. And he holds it over his head, ready to smash it when he realizes that he needs to feed it positive emotions instead. It's the only thing that he can do to end this. If he just breaks it, the entire world will be stuck with thoughts of hatred. So he thinks about everything that he has, his family, his safety net, and he changed the Paragon's mind. Grayson walked back into the debriefing where Mr. Minos congratulated him for a job well done, and he wished that he could have been there. As he said that, he and Helena shared a look. Back in God's garden, Midnighter tells the gardener that he's done with this mission. He can't work for someone with a hidden agenda. He isn't Grayson. They've been sending him and his partner Helena off to recover the enhanced organs that grant superhuman powers from the world. But why have they been doing this? Because as the man in charge, Mr. Minos has said, it's so that he could uncover the secrets of the Justice League. Grayson knew that this was a lie, and even Midnighter told him that this was a lie. But Grayson went along with the plans to figure out what the true mission was. But now, Mr. Minos has enough of the organs, and it's time for him to enact his new plan. 
He is a man of secrets. He enjoys them and he wants more of them. And he opens up his mission by firing a crossbow bolt from Helena's own crossbow into her chest. The doctor comes running out with Helena in her arms, bleeding all over the place as Dick Grayson is teaching his students gymnastics. Where is the doctor, Grayson? Helena, what happened? Grayson yells, running to her side. She explains in a very weak voice that it was Mr. Minos. He fired a bolt into her chest, aiming for her heart, but she always keeps the sights off target when she's not using it. After he shot her, she played dead so that he would leave. She then pulls the bolt out of her own chest. Dick, listen, all of the agents are on mission except for you and Agent One. He'll hit Agent One first because he's at noon prayers in the chapel. She then passes out in his arms. Grayson stands up furious. I'm going after Minos. Wait, I've known this man for years. He's smarter than anyone and he'll know you're coming, the doctor tries to tell him. Do you think I care? He says, kicking out the window. All of the students are being escorted out of the room, but a few of the girls who have taken a liking to Grayson decide that they're going to have some fun with this, and they go get their masks. Meanwhile, in the chapel, Mr. Mino shows up and points a gun at Agent One's head. Agent One then spins around knocking the gun out of Mr. Minos' hand and then shoves him to the ground, pointing the gun at his crotch. You have three seconds to tell me if you've gone crazy or what the meaning of this is. Mr. Minos tells him, I have a secret. Meet Paragon. At that moment, Agent One is thrown into a wall by a cyborg robot monster. See, Paragon has the powers of the Justice League. I know, I know. I told everyone that we were collecting the organs to identify the heroes, but when you're planning to expose the secrets of a horribly powerful organization like Spiral, it can't hurt to have a few of these on your side. Paragon begins to crackle as he charges up a beam similar to Cyborg's energy, and he blasts it at Agent One! Luckily, Grayson arrived just in time to pull him out of the way. What do you know? Grayson asks him. Minos is insane, and the monster has the powers of the JLA. We're going to die. What do you know? Minos took out Helena and the comms. We're all that's left. We're not gonna die, Grayson tells him, as he's dodging more of Paragon's blasts. Have I mentioned you're an idiot, Dick Grayson? Agent One says as he also leaps out of the way of another blast. Yeah, that's pretty much implied, but I've been working alongside the JLA for a long time, trained with them, and they have weaknesses. So will he. He then explains as he dodges and maneuvers around every one of Paragon's moves over and over. Cyborg's blasts are preceded by a small crackle. The Flash needs room for his speed to work, so stay in close. Aquaman's eyes are perfect. That makes his aim perfect, but it also makes him predictable. Green Lantern's constructs require a crazy concentration, so come in from multiple angles to confuse him. And Superman's breath takes 4.2 seconds from when it hits you to take you down. Plenty of time to maneuver away from it. Martian Manhunter's mind attack just takes concentration of will to avoid. He then goes in to hit Paragon, telling Agent One to never give in. And then as he helps him to his feet, he says, At least he doesn't have Wonder Woman's strength. Thank God we never got the... the heart. We never brought back the heart! Grayson realizes what they can do to stop Paragon, except they both realize that Agent One's gun is on the other side of Paragon. That's when they're saved by the girls from the school, as they come running in with their masks, launching darts at Paragon to distract him. Grayson does a backflip over Paragon, catching the gun as the girls throw it to him, and then he lands, shooting Paragon right through the heart, shutting him down. Minos walks over clapping, telling them they did a job well done. Now they can just sweep him away, another secret to be kept. But how will they keep him from talking? He's been using Spiral to get all of the world's secrets, and he now has everything. And that's when a crossbow bolt appears in his chest, right in his heart. And behind him is Helena. I fixed the sights. Ending Minos. But did they really? Across the world, Minos is sitting at a diner explaining that he left a light composite of his own design behind to pretend to be him. Someone to play the cliched explain everything villain that every hero wants to fight. So they'll fight him and the real Minos can walk away. The woman sitting across from him asks him, where will you go? What if I need to reach you? And he responds with, Ireland, I'll be in Ireland. But before he can go, she asks one last question. How did you know? No? Like, how did you know Spiral didn't manipulate you into doing this? I mean, they knew who you were all along. And maybe they just wanted someone like you to be their face for a while. What? W why? You said it yourself. You're kind of a cliched bat villain, except you obsess over secrets instead of things like penguins. The exact type of thing that they could use to attract someone like Grayson into their web? Wait, what? H how do you? And now they can gently encourage him to serve their larger purpose. And now they can let you go. Wait, do I know you? You're, you're Agent Zero. You were only a rumor in Spiral's files. Oh God, please don't do this. At least let one last secret come out. My name is... And she kills him. 
Honestly, Mr. Whatever, do you really think I care? This is during the period in which Batman had amnesia and with no word from home base, Grayson stayed with Spiral trying to figure out what his next move was. Because every time that he would call up and ask to go home, he got no answers. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Helena, the now leader of Spiral, gets a report that Agent 37, also known as Grayson, has been seen killing other agents around the world. The organization that controls Spiral from the shadows informs her that it was done with the same weapon that Grayson uses, so it has to be him. Over in a museum, Grayson breaks in with Tiger, another agent of Spiral, to conduct their current mission, to retrieve a large rock of kryptonite and deliver it to the buyer. Grayson lets Tiger drop the guard, and he throws on his suit with it giving him a series of problems, he asks Tiger, Am I straight? Referring to his bow tie. While this is going on, Helena is going through all of the evidence that points to Grayson. None of this is adding up. Why would he betray her and Spiral at this point? But all of the pieces do fit, it could only be him. Back in Spain, Grayson goes to the dance floor and he spies the woman with the big rock on a necklace. Then, as they proceed to dance the night away, Grayson makes his move and he snatches the gem off of her necklace, pocketing it. He then goes into full distraction mode, giving her a kiss and walking away. She notices right away that the stone has been taken as she begins to shout out, THIEF! THIEF! With a smile, Grayson runs back into the halls where Tiger is waiting for him. He begins to sprint down the hallways and Helena gives him a call, telling him to take Tiger out of the equation. Agent 1 may have been compromised. So Grayson cocks his arm back, dropping Tiger. Really sorry, man, but it looks like they always used to say, when you stop listening to the voices in your head, you've probably gone crazy. He then makes a break for it, leaving Tiger at the mercy of the guards. Tiger looks around and simply says, You're an idiot, Grayson. Grayson runs across the building to where a guard is being questioned about the mysterious person that he can't remember. Because Spiral has special technology called Hypnos that blurs individuals' faces so you'll never know that they were there. The guard only remembers the tuxedo, but as Grayson runs through kicking him in the head, he tells him, Don't forget my smile! Tiger looks at the guards and he begins to drop them all within seconds. Then he decides that he's going to get his revenge on Grayson. No one betrays Tiger. As he slips away requesting an extraction from Elena, she informs Tiger that he isn't to go after Grayson. Without much more to go on, Grayson makes his way to the drop-off point to meet the buyer. Helena still hasn't told him what's going on, and as far as he's concerned, Tiger is the compromised agent. And he's now been handled. But when he gets to the drop-off point, he sees one person who should never have kryptonite. Lex Luthor. He is the drop-off. Grayson smiles at him. Do you really think I'm going to turn this over to you, Luthor? And Luther explains that ever since Forever Evil, I've been a member of the Justice League, and I'm doing my duty to acquire all of their weaknesses to remove them from the playing field. But Grayson doesn't believe it. Why would Spiral deal with him? Lex explains, Who do you think invented the Hypnos technology that they stole and re-engineered? The technology that allows them to remain hidden and talk telepathically. I have the next phase of it, complete body control. He then demonstrates by taking control of Grayson's body, forcing him to almost grab the waitress's butt next to him. Realizing that he can't win against this, Grayson throws coffee into Lex's face and he jumps off the side of the cliff onto his own ride which is hidden right there. Even with Lex's drones chasing him, he rockets into the night sky. He tries to call up Helena to report and ask what's going on, and she doesn't answer, leaving him to assume that everything that he thought was going on is wrong. And he wrongfully dropped Agent 1 back in the museum. So he has Spiral HQ give him Agent 1's location, and he begins to head over to that direction. Agent 1 during all of this is beneath Rome, Italy, in a burial room filled with skulls. He's stooping around on his current mission, when out of nowhere, Grayson appears above him and begins to strangle him. Tiger hits the ground in pain, and the fake Grayson drops behind him, asking, Who am I? He begins to beat down Tiger with his batons until Grayson sees himself. You know, I've never really seen myself from this angle. No idea what all the fuss is about. Let me guess, Clayface? The two Graysons begin to battle it out, with Grayson trying to guess who the fake Grayson really is. As they begin to battle, he asks, Do you ooze? Because if you ooze, you're Clayface. And then he knocks the faker back, and he sees no ooze. Gotcha, so no Clayface. And you're talking in complete sentences, so that kind of rules out Killer Croc in a good mask. Then Grayson jumps in, kicking himself in the face. Wait, I got it. You're secretly Wonder Woman. Now hear me out here. He keeps throwing punches over and over, explaining that he thinks that it's Wonder Woman because she's doing this so that she can get with him. She must be tired of Superman. Then he leans in. How about a kiss? And he headbutts the evil doppelganger. The doppelganger hits the ground and Grayson smirks. Damn, I headbutted myself. Might be a metaphor for every girl that I've dated. But at this time, the doppelganger decides to start playing the talking game. Barbara might agree, or Corey. Grayson is thrown off. What did you say? The doppelganger gets back up and begins swinging. How about I guess who you are? Are you Robin? Nightwing? Agent 37? The fight continues and Grayson is starting to get mad. Who is this? They know everything about him. 
He finally has had enough and he runs in furious, so the doppelganger throws his hypnos into a loop, forcing him to hit the ground. You don't understand these hypnos at all, do you, Grayson? You can be made to see whatever they want you to see, and you didn't even see yourself losing. In the vertigo state that he is in, Grayson gets up and he approaches himself. But there's one secret weapon that very few people know about, and Helena has used it on him before. The kill command for the hypnos. And this person has that kill command. The doppelganger says it. And then Grayson hits the ground, confused and disoriented. And the doppelganger looks over at Tiger to see him ripping the hypnos out of his own eyes, allowing him to see the truth, the person behind this whole plan. Agent 8, his partner that died. Tiger and Grayson reported in the next day to Helena. Tiger told her that he pulled out his hypnos and he saw who it was. Maxwell Lord of Checkmate trying to ruin Spiral from the inside. And since he was the only one to see who it truly was, no one questions him. But Grayson is fed up with this. These little games that these spy organizations play are stupid and he's tired of it all. He completed his job and now he can't even contact Batman. So he tells Helena that he's done and he's leaving. And he walks out of the office. In his room, he grabs his comp, his only communication with Batman, and he tells him, I'm coming home, and I hope you can read this. It's time for Grayson to go back to Gotham after everyone has assumed that he's dead to find out where Batman is. Agent 8 slipped away and reported that Tiger was going to say what she told him too. She knows that he will. And Dr. Nets, the doctor who works her spiral, tells her, good, the plans are working. Dick had Alfred help him with his makeup and his wig. He'd become reliant on the hypnos that Spyro was providing him with to hide his identity. And with Bruce remembering nothing, Dick wanted to remain hidden. He sat down and he started to chat with Bruce, feeling him out, and to see what this whole situation means. What he decides is that Bruce is happy being oblivious, and he'll honor Alfred's wishes of not bringing him back into the Batman life. At that moment, the window behind Bruce shatters, and in comes a Spiral agent. She hits Bruce with a tranquilizer right away, and then informs Agent 37 that Spyro isn't done with him. Though she imagined that the first time that she met him, he would have his shirt off, you know, because of the rumors. Dick gets up and tells her that she really shouldn't be here. He left the life of Spiral, and as they tumble over the furniture, she informs Dick that Spiral isn't done with him yet. If he doesn't return to work at HQ, they'll reveal to the world that Bruce Wayne was Batman, and they'll ruin everything for the man. And Dick asks her, who are you? And she informs him that she is Agent Zero, the spider in the web. She's calling him home. She then hits him hard and leaves him there. As much as Dick Grayson wants everything to go back to the way it was, it would look like he has one more thing to do with Spiral. But before he can do that, Jason Todd punches him across the face. He isn't happy that Dick lied to them. To them, his brothers! You don't do that to another Robin. Dick tries to apologize, but Tim cuts him off. We all die. We're all going to die. But you didn't die. You just lied. He tries to give them a speech, telling them that it was for the betterment of the family and that everything will be better, but neither of them wants to hear it. So he begins to pull out a gift that he took from the back. Cave, the first two batarangs that Batman used, and he throws them to Jason and Tim. He tells them, I want you to know. Really, I need you to know. Everything we've been through together, all of that never left me, never will leave me. Knowing you guys are behind me is more important than anything. I'm not just another fellow disciple of the Bat or whatever. Tim, Jason, I'm your brother. Jason stops him. Wait, are you using that cut? And Tim cuts him off. Shh. So Dick moves on to the next person on his list, Barbara Gordon. He had something with her, though they've never really fully explored it. He tells her that he's sorry, so, so sorry, but she doesn't want to hear it. She knows he did it because Batman asked him, and even when she recognized him, he didn't tell her that it was him. She jumps off the bridge that they are on to get away from Grayson, and he jumps off after her without even having a rope. In the end, she caught him. She'll always catch him. Barbara. It was you and me in the very beginning. Remember that, okay? Everything else, the evil villains, the Batmen, the worlds on the brink, a thousand dangers and horrors streaming and knocking me down, strangling me, killing me. I swear it doesn't matter because I always come back to you, to you. She looks at him in the eyes and asks him, is that your stupid clue master? And Dick moves on to his last location, Damian Wayne. They both look at each other and declare, you're alive? You see, when Dick left, Damien was dead, but Batman went to Apocalypse to revive him. Damien was the least upset with Dick's return. He was just happy to have his older brother back. And Dick told him, before we get into it, and we have a lot to get into, I have to tell you something. Red Robin, Red Hood, Batgirl, I know they could take me leaving. Each of them has been in the game a long time, and you've seen things too, I know. Kids like you, well, there aren't a lot of kids like you. I just want to say, how you took it, how you went on, to see what you're doing, what you've become, I'm nothing but proud. Damien looks at him, wait, are you using that asinine child's game you taught me? The Clue Master's Code! Everyone, of course, figured it out the moment that Dick Grayson left. You see, the whole time, Dick has been seeing the Bat Family to deliver a secret message that only they could crack. They all type in the code and they hack 
back into Spiral's Hypnos program. And with that, Dick Grayson goes back undercover for one last mission as Agent 37, but with the Bat family's support this time. He walks into the office of Agent Zero to inform her that he is back in action. And as Agent Zero welcomes Dick back into the fold, keeping her face hidden with Hypnos, Batgirl decrypts the Hypnos, showing Dick who he's been talking to. Luna Nets, Agent Zero. And it's time for Agent 37 to put an end to this whole operation. Helena, the director of Spiral, is standing next to him. I would like to welcome you back and formally apologize for the incident with Lex Luthor. If I had known that he was working for Argus, I never would have arranged that deal. I would also like to assure you that Spiral is not capable of controlling a person through their hypnos. Your privacy and integrity are our utmost concern. Privacy and integrity, huh? Grayson says as Dr. Nets is inspecting every vital part of his naked body after he returned from going AWOL. Ah! The doctor exclaims, I have found a tracer! No, wait. It's a mole. Once he's deemed safe for work, he pulls his pants back on and he's told that his next mission is to assist Agent One. The two men board a ship for passage to their location and midway over the ocean, the dread pirate Tiger Shark tries to commandeer the ship. He walks on board and he thanks the captain for not starting any problems. But then his men tell him, uh, sir, we have a problem. We can't see these guys' faces. You see, the hypnos that spiral agents use blur their faces to anyone not wearing it. And once they've been discovered, they jump in kicking. Tiger Shark is in shock. What? These clouds move like Batman and Agent 1 hits a man telling him, I'll take time to nurse the wounds after being compared to a dead man. Grayson grabs a cable and pulls himself up over everyone telling Agent 1 to have a little respect. The two of them keep beating down the thugs, but then Tiger Shark's sub decides to launch a torpedo at the boat. He figures, worst case scenario, he's out of boss and a job. But before he can, other devices arrive, shocking the entire boat and the shark. And with that, Grayson kicks Tiger Shark in the head, ending the conflict. Both Agent 1 and Grayson go below deck, where the captain walks up to them wanting to celebrate with vodka. Once Agent 1 walks away, Grayson calls up Red Robin to get reports. When Grayson returned to Spiral, he had learned that Agent Zero, the woman behind everything, was Luca Nets. They can't trace much of her, except that she is somehow related to the Dr. Nets, who also works there, the one who was just inspecting Grayson's body. But when Tim went digging for information, he found something odd. Luca Nets has always popped up, spying on Batman and Robin. She's fascinated with them. She can be seen in the background of almost every photo taken at every one of Batman's events, tracing all the way back to zero year. She's been watching Dick Grayson this entire time, but why? Through all of his tracing, though, he found someone trying to find information on Luca Nets. This person was wiping out information on the internet. So Tim traced the IP address back to a place right outside of Berlin. So Grayson tries to figure out how he can get Spiral to send him to Berlin so he can have a look at this place, and he needs them to assume that it was their idea. Tim suggests that he use the Grayson charm on the director. Grayson tells him his charms won't work on her, but his charms will work on him, though. And Tim stops him. Did you say him? Meanwhile, Helena, the director of Spiral, calls a meeting of the heads of the organization. Organization. She tells them how it is. She will be stopping Checkmate, God Garden, and anyone else who endangers her agents. If any of them get in her way, she'll be dragging them into the light. She then suits up and heads outside where she gets a report. The God Garden opened up a door into Berlin, Germany. Over in Berlin, a mostly robotic girl named Maxine teleports in with news that there is a building being used for human genetic experiments. Lady Tron, as she prefers to be called, heads over there to stop these experiments. Grayson and Agent One are watching from a safe spot as members of God Garden are moving in. And then Grayson reports back to Helena, who responds to him telling him to remind God Garden that secrets are Spiral's domain. That's it. He got the permission that he needed to break into the building. As Grayson and Agent One jump into attack, Midnighter is watching from the distance. Midnighter is the one who arranged the little God Garden arrival, which is how this entire excuse was created. As Midnighter lands in a cafe, though, he takes off his helmet, and Agent Zero herself sees what's going on and reports that she has company. Robotic spiders come in out of nowhere, interrupting Grayson. Grayson and Agent One and Lady Tron, so they have to change their focus from their personal battle to destroying the spiders. Lady Tron starts asking them to stop, attack the fleshies! But of course, the robot spiders aren't listening, and it's Grayson who asks Agent One, do these look like spiral robots to you? Yeah, so why are they attacking us, Grayson? Call the director now. They continue to smash as many of the robots as they can, and Lady Tron hits them with sonic screams, but it's not enough as there are dozens of robots. Then Lady Tron notices her robotic hand is missing. Hey, enemy agents, I'm pretty sure these things are eating matter to create more weapons webs because they totally ate my hand. Agent One realizes that they are in trouble, so he grabs the mechanical woman and Grayson and using her 600 pounds of weight, they all come crashing through the vents into a large server room. The spiders are still chasing them though, so Agent One has an idea. Lady Tron, use your reactor to send off an EMP killing off the spiders. And Grayson has an answer to that. Punch Agent One across the face. Grayson, 
You bastard. Then Grayson kicks him, knocking him out. Grayson then looks at Lady Tron, and using his hypnos, he hacks into her brain to inform her. Maxine, you're in a nice and warm place. The story of Spiral actually began with a young scientist, the original Agent Zero. He was the smasher of heroes. With Spiral, he was able to control the world. He was so powerful, so confident, and utterly bored. It was during the First World War that he began to realize that all battles have to come to an end. All become their own enemies, and all eventually destroy that which they created. Agent Zero realized that he must keep the war from ever ending. He had to find new enemies and challenge himself. So he created a secret army called the Leviathan that would infiltrate Spiral. He created a never-ending Ouroboros, endlessly eating its own tail. His name was Otto Nets, and he eventually became known as Dr. Daedalus. Meanwhile, back in the current time, Grayson has put a positive memory into Maxine's head, and he begins to ask her to hack into the computers for him. But the moment that Helena calls him, asking what the hell's going on, Grayson explains that he and Agent One have beaten the enemy agent, and they are just hanging around. He then hangs up, and she doesn't believe him. Our story of the beginning of Spiral continues, though. Eventually, the master of all, Agent Zero, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and he realized that he was fading fast. He needed somehow to live forever. So he went off to make a home and have two daughters, Elizabeth and Katrina Nets. They are his future and his past. Back with Grayson, he asks Maxine to tell him everything that she can find out about Spiral, and that's when he gets this story. Over with Helena, the spider calls her, a being that works behind the scenes of Spiral, demanding to know where Grayson is. Back in our Spiral origin story, Agent Zero explains that he discovered a way to encode himself and his mind into a computer system, into the web that is Spiral. He would become a spider. But he wanted this version of himself to always be challenged, to become the wise spider of Poet's Tower. So his daughters had a purpose. One was to become him, Agent Zero, and the other would challenge him as a Leviathan. This is the story that Grayson receives, and he realizes what is going on. Spiral is in a never-ending game for the Nets family. The spider then tells Helena that Grayson must be stopped, and she will have the nano spider bots devour him. She refuses, but it doesn't matter. The spider demands it, and she is forced to press the button. And as they begin to approach Grayson, Agent 1, and Maxine. Grayson grabs Maxine by the shoulders and he tells her, you need to use the EMP now, Maxine, do it! With that, the EMP goes off and all power in the area is dead. Back at the Spiral headquarters, Dr. Nets answers her phone. Elizabeth Nets speaking, and on the other end, her sister, the current Agent Zero. Oh, you play the game well, sister. You covered my and your tracks well. Grayson tells Maxine to take a nap, and then out of nowhere, Agent 1 jumps on top of him. Nothing! Not Helena or God can save you now, Grayson. He throws Grayson into the ground and Grayson tells him to stop, listen to me. But Agent One is tired of Grayson hitting him. Luke and Ness, Elizabeth Ness, Helena, we have to stop them all, Tiger. We have to destroy Spiral. And that is where our story with Grayson and Agent 37 is currently at. In Nice, France, a car is racing down the street where it comes to a sudden stop. A man walks out of the driver's seat and he begins fixing his cufflinks as he walks to the back where a man is handcuffed. The handcuffed man looks at him. Please, please, please! And Dick Grayson leans down with a smile. Password? Swordfish! Swordfish! Dick Grayson puts his prisoner into the trunk and he tells the valet to keep the car handy. He'll be leaving soon. Oh, and don't press the red button, it's a parachute. He walks to the door and he tells them the password? Swordfish. Then he walks inside and he gets behind the bar. Another man walks over asking for a drink. A surprise. He wants something nice. So Grayson jumps out from behind the counter. Surprise! And he kicks the man in the face. He puts him into a headlock and he tells him to relay a message to Spiral Command. Tell Helena that I'm coming for every agent in Spiral. I'm taking them all down and I'm taking Spiral down. He then grabs the briefcase the man had and he makes a break for the exit where Tiger, his partner, is waiting with the car. He climbs inside asking him, what agent was that? Seven. He's 38 Agents ahead of me? That guy? Is there any way for me to retake the agent test? Because you know, I had a problem with my pencil that day. Five days pass and Grayson and Tiger are now in the Alps. I'm pushing the red button, Tiger. I told you no. I know, I know. I totally heard you, Tony the Tiger. I also told you not to call me that. It just seems like one of those textbook red button moments. Then around them, various men with guns and skis come whipping by, and the car that they are in jumps a snowy gap to another cliffside. You know, I used to drive shotgun with Batman, you know, obsessed, insane, wears a bat suit, doesn't believe in fear. I was never really scared of his driving, and I've only been with you for one week. One week, Tiger! And all I can say is that I wish I still wore my yellow pants. You know, you get it? Yellow pants, because I'm so scared. I might pee. I get it. Shut up and push the red button. 
You told me not to push the red button. Yes, and now I'm telling you to push it. Does this mean that you're backsliding on the Tony the Tiger thing too? Because I kind of like that nickname, and you can call me Spy Wonder. Damn it, push the button, idiot. So Grayson hits the button, and the parachute fires off. Yeah, I knew you'd insist on idiot. Spy Wonder, I hardly knew you. They park the car in the snow, and Grayson gets out asking which agents are these. And Tiger tells him, five and 19. Oh, come on, is everyone above me? Are there no agents 38 and up? They all had their pencils working on the proper day. Back at the spiral headquarters, Dr. Nets reports in that they are losing agents all over the place. While they can replace them, Helena has a better plan. Meanwhile, in Greece, Tiger and Grayson drop another series of agents. And this leads to a montage across Georgia, Russia, Mongolia, China, Timor, and Thailand. Well, Grayson saying his spy song. He's the spy, the spy with the face of swirls. He gets all the girls, but he calls them women because girls, though it fits the rhyming scheme, is kind of misogynistic and doesn't show proper respect for the equal sex. Elena is forced to call on the big dogs, the syndicate. Even Tiger is slightly fearful because regardless of how good Grayson and Tiger are, the syndicate is bad news and it means the end of our hero's journey to disassemble Spiral. Tiger tells Dick that they're not gonna be able to complete this mission without help and they need to find people they can trust. So, Dick comes up with an idea to approach a competing spy agency and ask Maxwell Lord of Checkmate for help. It's time to get Checkmate involved and have them fight Spiral. It's time for the Spy Wars. While Grifter is briefing the Syndicate so that he can head out on the mission, Agent One and Grayson are stalking another enemy agent, an agent from the organization Shade, Frankenstein. Things are going fine until Frankenstein throws undead monkeys at Agent One. Grayson was talking to him on the radio, and that's when he suddenly hears, Cree! 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 Please tell me you're just watching Alvin and the Chipmunks. Again, he swings into action and sees Frankenstein charging into his victim while still pinned underneath the undead monkeys. Frankenstein throws Grayson aside, and realizing what they're up against, Grayson activates his new weapon, and he sucker punches Frankenstein with a hard light construct. Tiger throws one on himself, and the two of them begin to hit Frankenstein over and over, pushing him into a wall until they get him boxed in and then water pours on him and freezes him into place. Then out walks their new partner, Maxwell Lord of Checkmate. He asks for his weapons back and he agrees that their deal has now been made. They brought him Frankenstein so he'll help them in their battle against Spiral. The two of them head to Mexico where they finally sit down and talk a little. And Grayson tells him a story of summer camp. He would be sent to this camp where all of the other students from nearby schools were also going. People who never knew each other would all arrive at the same time. Then they would all magically become best friends within hours, even though they were complete strangers. Something about the fact that everything was new and exciting made those friends more intense. That's what being a spy is like for him, like summer camp. They both stand up and Grayson turns to Tiger. You can call me an idiot now, Agent One. I, I have made my distaste for your history and many of your present actions quite clear. But know this, as I have come to know you, I have to admit to myself that I may not like working with you. I indeed like. And then before he can finish, Tiger is punched across the face by a mini person. The mini person then grows to a full size person and is pink. Grayson tries to punch her, but his force is thrown back at him. And then Grifter arrives, grabbing Grayson by the arm and throwing him to the ground. They flip around a little bit and Grayson asks him, how did Helena get you on board, Red Hanky? Meanwhile, Tiger is fighting the pink person as she grows, shrinks, and bounces him around. I told Helena that I was getting bored fighting against her easy agents. So she sent a toy that throws my own might back at me. Genius, he says as he hits the ground. Back with Grayson, he is constantly dodging Grifter as he fires his guns at him. That is until Grayson figures out that Grifter is following his movements telepathically. So he throws a baton against the wall. It bounces around throwing off Grifter, and as it comes for his head, he shoots it out of the sky. But that was a distraction as Grayson kicks him on the side of the head and disarms him. The two of them continue their dance on the roof, and Grayson throws his batons against the walls, bouncing them down ahead of them until he pins down Grifter. Then, after a short while, he shows up with Tiger and his eyes bleeding. He tried to use his hypnos to read Grifter's mind, but when Grifter resisted, he forced it. And that's when he tells Tiger the news. The Syndicate know all about Spiral, Helena and Otto Nets and the plan to cause chaos within the world. So why did they come after us? Tiger wants to know. Because Helena hired them and they want to keep up appearances. The truth is, the spy wars are beginning and it is now Grayson Tiger checkmate in the syndicate against Helena and Spiral and it's about to get messy.
after receiving a tip from Grayson that Leviathan was on their way. Helena and Dr. Ness began to get the students of the finishing school down into the lower level shelters. As the two of them make their way back outside, Helena is attacked by Leviathan and King Faraway calls out to execute Omega Attack. One by one, the members each shoot and beat Helena down to the ground. And just as Faraday begins to gloat, he is stopped by Grayson, punching him in the face, saying, Sorry, were you still gonna go on? Grayson and Agent One begin fighting off everyone while Grayson tells Dr. Ness to go ahead and get Helena the medical attention that she needs. They're going to need to be preoccupied for a bit. Over at the Skull Girls dorm, Agent Zero tells the girls that they're going to have to help her save the school. Agent Zero is the individual who is trying to turn Spiral into an organization of chaos and destruction. And she explains to the Skull Girls that the people fighting out there, Agents 37, 1, and 8, they're all traitors and Matron Bertinelli is dead. Everyone else alive is working for Dr. Nets and they're really working for a secret organization called Leviathan. Leviathan is another top secret spy organization that has been brought together to fight against Spiral, to give Spiral something to battle against for ages and ages. But now it's about to get messy. One of the Skull Girls asks Agent Zero why they should trust her, and Agent Zero tells them that they have never given them anything, but she has come bearing gifts in the form of weapons. While Dr. Nets begins to prepare Helena for surgery, machines begin to cover Helena's body, and Spider tells her that the Matron has returned to the womb. Dr. Nets says that Helena needs surgery, but Spider tells her that she isn't the only healer within the web. Besides, right now, she needs to sit at Spiral Center and welcome her father home. She then calls up Agent 8, stating that she is now in command of Spiral. The awakening is happening sooner than expected, so engage the attackers. A short while later, Agent 8 is slowly backed into a corner by the Skull Girls after receiving a beating. Agent 8 says that she couldn't tell them how long she's waited for this day, but all of the girls then draw their weapons telling her she must have forgotten who lives here. They are the Skull Girls. And Agent 8 responds with, well, you must be confused because really, you're just a bunch of corpses. And she pulls the pin on a grenade. Outside with Grayson and Agent 1, he calls out that there are innocent kids in there. But Faraday tells him that there are no innocents here. But whoever did that had nothing to do with us. Grayson calls him a liar, but as Agent 1 is pinned to the ground, he tells him, no, I'm telling the truth. It's her. As smoke begins to settle, Agent 8 walks out standing over the bodies of the Skull Girls. Agent 1 then gets back up stating, stay out of this fight. This is all his. And Grayson says, neither of them stand a chance alone. But let me make a call to Mr. Fight. A door begins to open and through it, Midnighter walks out stating, hey, I'm not the romantic type, but I could kiss you right now, Grayson. Grayson runs over to check on the Skull Girls and they all jump up calling him a traitor. One of the girls states that Agent Zero says goodbye and Grayson tells him, no wonder why there's an outbreak of crazy. She's the enemy. You're not fighting for Spiral. You're being used by Leviathan, Skull Girls. Soon Grayson manages to convince the girls to stand down just as Agent One finishes his fight by shooting Agent Eight, his old partner. Grayson meets back up with them, telling him, score one for the good guys. And Agent One tells him, yeah, good guys. Back down in Dr. Nets' lab, Agent Zero says hello to her sister. Agent Zero and Dr. Nets are both children of the original evil Nets. Dr. Nets tells her, yes, I can hear you very loud and clear. And I will miss you when you're gone, sister. Luca, who also goes by the name Agent Zero's eyes widen up. And in a fit of rage, she headbutts Elizabeth, also known as Dr. Nets, stating, when she's gone, I'm the chosen one. I'm Agent Zero. The two sisters begin to fight and struggle with each other, and then they stop and a voice tells them, don't stop on my account, daughters. They look up to see Helena standing, telling them to fight harder. Helena then tells the girl that she is Dr. Daedalus, but Elizabeth says, don't you see? Our destiny, it's all been a trick. The crown was never ours, it was his. Otto wears the crown to fly close to the sun, but fear not, they can still serve the coming cataclysm if they are willing. Outside, as the fighting settles, Grayson says that they need to find Helena, but Agent One tells him it's too late, she's gone. The return of Dr. Daedalus is at hand, and Helena is his chosen vessel. Dr. Daedalus is the father of both Dr. Nets and Agent Zero, also known as Elizabeth and Luca, and he is the one that orchestrated the entire Leviathan versus Spiral situation, and he put his brain into the computer so that he can live forever, so that he can be reborn in an individual eventually, so that he can bring the end of times, the cataclysm. The entire thing was so that he would not get bored. That's it. I had to explain it, like lay it out for you so you'd understand. But let's go ahead and move on. Back in the lab, Dr. Daedalus tells them that he will give them one choice, kill or die. Now, if one of them would like to join him, he has needs beyond this cellar. Luca pulls out a gun repeating, one of us? Grayson tells Agent One to tell him what's happening. And Agent One tells him, Spider has been playing us all. It could never be allowed to win. But I have higher allegiances than you, Grayson. And Midnighter says, Hate to be the one to tell you. Pretty sure your friend works for Checkmate, Grayson. This really isn't my scene, so I'm uh, gonna be going now. And Agent One tells Grayson to stand down. This is Checkmate's operation now. Agent One has been a double agent this whole time! 
Soon, Agent One gets word to follow Dr. Daedalus, and he's been given a small jetpack. But as he leaves, Grayson jumps onto their helicopter and follows. During the chase, Grayson fires missiles, forcing Agent One to eject from his gear. But on his way down, Agent One falls towards the helicopter, shooting at it! He tells Grayson that Spiral has been playing on Checkmate's board from the start. They've been trying to keep everyone within Spiral from fulfilling Dr. Daedalus' plan, keeping watch and keeping the great Dick Grayson tied up. Grayson jumps from the cockpit of the helicopter to the roof of the helicopter, stating, You missed one thing. I like being tied up. He then lands on Agent 1, and the two of them begin to punch each other back and forth until Agent 1 manages to throw Grayson off of the helicopter. He luckily had a parachute, while Agent 1 begins to ride the burning helicopter down to the ground. Elsewhere, Dr. Daedalus and Luca are riding a train, and he asks if her sister died well, and Luca tells him, Of course. He goes on to state that he thought that maybe she would surprise him. He did make her smarter, but Luca says, Yes. But why didn't you make us both smart? And Dr. Daedalus informs her that he has no need for two smart children. He needed one to be cruel, so he bent the world into his desired shape. It's what he does. Luca then pulls her gun on Dr. Daedalus, telling him, Yes, but you're no father to me. You're just a blind scientist. And it is I who will be at the center of the web. So how does it feel to be the helpless one now? Dr. Daedalus pushes a button and electricity shoots out electrocuting Luca. And moments later, her body is dumped from the moving train. Back with Grayson and Agent 1, they begin to move back out while Agent 1 steals someone's car and Grayson goes to pick up his bike that he had hidden away. A short while later, Agent 1 asks, Where do you get all these ridiculous toys? And Grayson tells him, Don't be mad. We all can't be best friends with Batman. Agent 1 spins the car, firing his gun at Grayson, and he begins to drive back towards him, shouting, Do not make me kill you! And Grayson tells him, Don't worry, you won't! And then he hits a switch on his bike. The bike begins to speed up towards the oncoming car, and it rides up it, using it as a ramp, crushing the engine and driving off of it. Back over at Elizabeth's lab, Maxwell walks into a dying Elizabeth, and he tells her, Ugh, I can help you. I just need the Minos file and all the members of the Justice League, and I'll save your life. Besides, you never worked for him. He was the one pulling all of the strings. You're just a pawn. And she tells him, you think you've won? Well, let me ask you, when is a pawn not a pawn? As Elizabeth types away at the computer, the screen begins to change, stating that the archive files on the Justice League have been deleted. And she tells him, when it becomes a queen. Over in the snowy mountains, Grayson finally begins to get close to Dr. Daedalus, and he opens up the doors to his hideout. As he walks through the lower floors, he hears Dr. Daedalus stating that it looks like the fly has entered the web. And he tells him that he has one chance to let Helena go. And Dr. Daedalus tells him, I cannot. She is my vessel. And I am her god now. I am the center of the endless spiral, the mind of the cruelest leviathan. So step into my presence and see the truth, that I am the end. As Grayson enters, Dr. Daedalus begins to show him all of the things that has happened to him and tells him, There is no end to the spiral. There is no end for me. And he hits him with the end of his cane, stating, I will erase every trace of the woman you love. And Grayson says, I have a better idea. He jumps back up, kicking Dr. Daedalus, and he tells him, How about I take you? He continues punching him, telling him, Just let Helena go! Dr. Daedalus begins to laugh, stating, Love makes fools of us all, and Grayson asks him, Is that a yes? But Dr. Daedalus pulls away from him, telling him, You'll always fall into traps. It was always a yes. Light begins to fill the room, and then suddenly nothing but white can be seen. And then Grayson sees Helena. He runs over to help her up, and she asks, What did you do? And he tells her, What I had to. He begins to pick her up, and they walk towards the open door, and she asks him, What's your brilliant plan now? And he says, Actually, I have no plan. It's time for you to run. I've spent years training my mind, learning how to fight against monsters who would use me. And she tells him, that's right, you're a superhero. I forgot. The two of them begin to kiss, and Grayson says his goodbyes, and then his mind begins to get taken over by Dr. Daedalus. Back outside, Dr. Daedalus, now in full control of Grayson's body, stops Helena, telling her, it's a shame you didn't run fast enough. By the way, now that I'm in this body, I can tell you that Grayson only truly loves a woman named Barbara. Helena spits in his face and kicks him away, stating, Do you really think I care? He tells her, No, I think you no longer exist. Somnus, activate. Dr. Daedalus tells her soon, His thought suppression satellite will make it so that no one remembers his name. No records will carry his history. They will erase his soul from this world, and everyone will ask the question, Who is Dick Grayson? He then hears a voice telling him, That's a good question. And then he begins to see nothing. Dr. Daedalus asks Somnus, what is this? And Grayson tells him, the satellite can't hear you. You're in my mind, our mind. The world may have forgotten me, but here, 
That question's a bit more complicated, isn't it? So do you really want to know who Dick Grayson is? Well, you're about to find out. Dr. Daedalus' body begins to change, sprouting spider legs, stating that he will be the greatest version of them. But all of the versions of Dick Grayson begin to attack him, kicking and punching through his spider legs, telling him that he's done. Dr. Daedalus pulls out a gun, telling him that the world is theirs to shape. Join him! But Grayson says, it's not every day you get to become a Nazi warlord. I think I'm gonna have to pass. As Nightwing punches Dr. Daedalus down, he tells him that this will be the last offer that he makes. This will be the end. The spiders begin to crawl out, attacking the other versions of Grayson. But the Nightwing one says, it will be your end as well. Dr. Daedalus tells him that it's his kingdom. He can't dare defeat him without destroying him. The risk is too great. Nightwing leans in telling him, risk is what I do. Risk is who I am. And then he whispers the trigger word to deactivate the hypnos. Suchigomo. Just as he says it, Grayson and Dr. Daedalus' bodies begin to merge, and Dr. Daedalus shouts, No! The world is at my hands! I am the center! But soon, Dr. Daedalus' body begins to crumble and fade as Grayson falls into darkness. A week later, Grayson begins to wake up in a room and he starts to walk outside. When he opens the door, he sees Helena telling him, Welcome back, assuming you're Dick Grayson and not some bug-faced Hitler in there. She tells him that according to the world, Dick Grayson never existed. And according to Spiral, agents stop at 36. There is no Agent 37. But to her, he's unforgettable, which is why she programmed it so that she would remember into the Somnus satellite while she was trapped. She did make an exception, though. The family that he has in Gotham remembers him, but not many others. Just in case, he tried to be a hero. She goes on to state that what happened in the castle may be a normal Tuesday, but Daedalus was just in her head, and he made her feel things. A reminder of who she really was. Grayson says, a spy? And she tells him, no, a Bertinelli. After everything that's gone on, they may be free from Spiral, but that doesn't mean they are truly free. They have their own destinies. And she can't wait to see who he's going to be the next time they meet up. And Grayson tells her, you know what? Neither can I. Will I be the acrobat, the sidekick, the heir, the spy, or maybe just a hero? And now he's in an arcade with Damien, who is super excited to see him. Dick and Damien have been hanging out in the arcade while they catch up. Damien has been traveling the world making amends for his year of blood, which we also have videos on, while Dick was undercover with Spiral, which we also have videos on. Damien asks Dick about Helena Bertinelli. She was his partner and then the head of the spy organization, and once they discovered the master plan, she worked with him to end it. Damien asks, you think she'll be keeping in touch? But Dick isn't sure. After Dr. Daedalus messed with her mind, she seems to have other priorities. Flashback to three days ago, when Dick was packing his things and saying goodbye to the students at the school that was used as a cover for the spy organization Spiral. He went to Helena's room to knock on the door and say goodbye. And she told him that she was feeling under the weather and would not be in the mood for a goodbye. Because she was actually putting on her Huntress outfit to get ready for her next mission. To get revenge for the Bertinellis. And if you want to follow her, go check out Batgirl and the Birds of Prey. We already did a video on that. Back in the current times, Dick and Damien walk down downtown Gotham while Damien asks Dick about the files that Spiral had on all the secret identities of every superhero in the world. But Dick reassures him, telling him that all of those files have been collected by Batman and they've been destroyed. To make the situation even better, Dick trusts the current head of Spiral to keep his word that he won't explore the avenue again. It's his old partner, Tiger, former Agent One. Flashback to two days ago, as Dick Tiger, the synthetic assassin from the Syndicate and various other rookie agents were dropping a Hive experimental research facility. The rookies failed to stop the enemies and Tiger called them all almost as useless as Grayson himself. Aw, oh, thanks Tiger, Grayson says, kicking a guy in the face that was about to stab Tiger. Tiger allowed Grayson to come along even though he's not an active agent any longer and Grayson asked him about the device. Tiger assured him that it is being handled. So Grayson jumped on a drone and began to steer it away. Thanks Tony, I have a flight to catch. I told you not to call me that. And with that, he left his former partner in charge. Back in the current time at Wayne Manor, the two boys walk in and Damien asks Dick about the guy in all black. Dick tells him that his name was Midnighter and he prefers to be called Dick Grayson's arch nemesis. And he's pretty sure he's gonna see him around. Flashback to the day before in the Alps, when Grayson and Midnighter were fighting a weird monster, and they defeated him. Midnighter looks up the name of the project. Project Kilicorn? You aren't even trying anymore. The two of them walk through the door technology, teleporting them to the God Garden, a floating base up in space where Midnighter functions out of. And Grayson throws up from the door technology while Midnighter throws the Kilicorn to the ground. He then turns to Grayson. Here's the device the gardener says will help the kid. Grayson takes it, and then Midnighter simply tells him, It was fun being your nemester. Now go back to being a superhero. You're too nice for the spy work, Grayson. Back in the present, day, Grayson and Damien sit down and Grayson sticks the device up Damien's nose where it removes a bomb placed there by the Court of the Owls back in the days of Robin Wars. Damien rubs his nose. I demand action figures and ice cream. Batman walks over asking, did it work? 
which pisses off Damien since his father knew. So where are the Court of the Owls now? Well, Lincoln and March is standing in a labyrinth beneath Greece. He goes on to state that they have Nightwing on their side now, and new plans are in place. Everything will work beautifully from the shadows. And then, takes a dart to the eye. Another man walks forward telling him, this isn't a party for you. Back in the Batcave, Batman asks Dick Grayson if he's sure that he wants to do this. And Dick tells him, I do. They thought they could threaten my family and get what they wanted. But they were wrong, because Nightwing is back to infiltrate the Court of the Owls and follow up on that storyline from Robin Wars. Our story begins in Romania, with Dr. Leviticus and her undead friend digging through graves looking for her strange coins. As she finds them, she hears a voice stating, the parliament will pay well for those, and then the undead man is shot in the head. Dr. Leviticus turns back to see a gauntlet next to her head, and the voice tells her, what I want is to dig up the past, and if I don't get what I want, it will be you who is buried. Meanwhile, over in Greece, Dick Grayson, aka Nightwing, is summoned to the international branch of the Court of the Owls to discuss his, uh, less than satisfying results. The Court of the Owls thinks that they own Dick Grayson because they have threats against Damian Wayne, the current Robin, but what they don't know is that Dick is really playing them. Recently, the Owls of Dubai found themselves the target of a thief and outlaw named Raptor. However, his skills were deemed useful, and they were able to give him a financial counteroffer to have him work for the Owls instead. After his mission is complete in Moscow, Dick will meet with Raptor and accept his assistance and partnership and learn from him. Dick tells the man that they can make him join their little cult, stop Cobra from expanding into their territory, but just know that he won't be one of the talents. He's going to do things his way. Before leaving for Moscow, Dick meets up with Barbara Gordon, and to his surprise, it was not a date because she's in costume, to tell her that he's going to be going away for a bit of an undercover job. She tells him that she thought he was done doing all of that undercover stuff. He went through hell to get back his secret identity. It's going to be dangerous. And Dick tells her, everything they do is dangerous. They're currently on a 275 foot high bridge. Soon, Barbara hears on the scanner that there's a crime happening and tells Dick that he had better at least get her a souvenir from this trip. Later, as Dick gets into Moscow, he finds his target and he acquires the documents that he had. But as he sits alone looking at the nesting doll with Barbara's name on it, he hears a voice telling him that he's pretty cocky for dropping his guard. Raptor states that he's followed him ever since his run and over in the square since he figured the danger was over. The name's Raptor, your new partner. Dick gets up stating, nice to meet you. I told the parliament that I would be doing this alone, nothing personal, but I've already had some of the best partners. Dick begins to leap up the wall, but before he can go, Raptor kicks him in the back, slamming him into the wall. From the ground, Dick tries kicking, but Raptor grabs his legs and throws him off the side. Dick gets up trying to hit him, but Raptor just taunts him and holds out his gauntlet, shooting gas. With Dick stunned, Raptor cracks him across the face, telling him that he needs to sit down, Shut up and listen, because everything Batman taught you, it's wrong. As Dick gathers his strength, he begins to leave, stating, I hope you had your fun, because I'm out. And Raptor stops him, stating, Wait, isn't that what superheroes do? Fight and then team up? Dick stops to listen, and Raptor explains the Parliament gave him an assignment involving the Cobra unit. They hijacked a ship over in the Black Sea belonging to a prominent member of the Parliament. Raptor whistles for his aircraft, telling Dick, You're a stranger here, so you're gonna need me. Someone to spot you. Dick figures, why not? He's got so much to teach him, and what he learned from Batman is wrong. What could go wrong? The next morning, Barbara calls up Dick, stating that she's going to be in Tokyo for a bit, but when he's free, she has a place for them to meet up so he can give her her present. But in the meantime, don't do anything dangerous. He tells her, me? Do something dangerous? It's like you hardly know me, Barbara. Shortly after, Dick and Raptor jump down into the Black Sea, and Dick notices a shark swimming a little close to them. Raptor says not to worry. These are common threshers, and they're not known to attack. But as the two of them swim off, Raptor is suddenly pulled underwater. Dick rushes underneath and he sees Raptor struggling with a snake man. But before he can help, Raptor's gauntlet begins to click and then a red liquid sprays out covering the creature. The sharks from before swim over attacking the snake man creature. And Dick asks Raptor, I thought you said they didn't attack. And Raptor tells him, they don't. But they do attack snake dudes who have just been sprayed to the shark attractant. Why would you even have that tool? The two of them quietly sneak into a ship and Dick decides that he'll do some investigating on his own and he heads into the lower levels. As he enters into a medical room, Dick notices two people People laying on the tables there, and then he hears music coming from underneath one of them. After pushing the table, he finds a trap, and behind him, one of the bodies begins to get up. And then another person starts to crawl out of the first one's stomach. The one from the stomach grabs a scalpel and swings at Dick, but before she can hit, Raptor jumps in, taking the blow. After realizing what's going on, Dick throws one of his batons, hitting the woman, and Raptor says, Did you want to know what the Parliament had that Cobra wanted? Dick tells him yes, but then Raptor notices the scalpel still inside of him, and he says, 
If this is how you watch a guy's back, it's a wonder Batman's still alive. Raptor then explains that Cobra's genetic research division is always looking for raw biological material. They prefer the forgotten people, the ones that no one will notice missing, refugees. The parliament is creating a new nation, a stronghold for the elite, and these people will build those walls. Back in Greece, the parliament commends Dick and Raptor for their success in taking back the boat and they hand them their next mission. As they're leaving though, Raptor asks a question that is kind of on Dick's mind. You want the parliament destroyed, right? Well, you need someone who's already got one foot in the dark. A guy who just delivered innocent people to the claws of the parliament. Dick punches them, telling him, shut up! Just tell me you have something. Something that could bring the parliament into light. Raptor whistles for his aircraft and Dick asks, why should I trust you? And he tells him, because I've always been playing the long game. The two of them then head to Norway for their next target, Nut Rudd, the world's most acclaimed designer of mazes. The story with Nut is that he got his fortune told by a tarot reader. The reader scared him by telling him that one day an assassin would come and kill him, so he turned his home into a giant trap-filled maze. But before they head inside, Raptor notices something and swings to protect Dick. His arm, though, is caught, and then he is slammed to the ground by Barbara Gordon. Raptor fires a dart at her, but Dick tells him, stop, whoa, 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 let's skip the fight and then the team-up thing. Can we just have a minute? Dick pulls Barbara aside, asking what she's doing, and she tells him, what the hell are you doing? She tracked his phone signal here because he stood her up and she was worried. Dick explains that this is the undercover job that he was doing, and things got kind of a little crazy, but he's close, and that's the important thing right now. He then leans in to whisper that that house down below them, there's a blueprint of the parliament's secret headquarters. They want it destroyed, but he's going to take it and finally put the parliament in jail. Raptor calls out that he doesn't want to be that guy, but they should probably get going if they're going to report back in the morning. Barbara starts heading down to the house with them, stating, well, I'm going to join you. If you can't make a date, then at least we're going to do superhero stuff. The three of them sneak into the mansion, and they begin going through nuts and traps within his giant maze until they reach the last room. On the floor is another puzzle, but this one is with tarot cards. Once all three of them are inside, the door is shut, and the ceiling begins to descend. Thinking back to Nut's vision, Dick arranges the cards just as the reading would have told him, with him dying in his home. And just as the ceiling is about to crush them, it stops. Raptor tells him, it worked. And then the lights go out and Barbara screams. Once the light comes back on, Dick sees Barbara on the ground and Raptor nowhere in sight. The two of them chase Raptor down the hallway, and as they enter the room, both of them stop and look in horror. As they see Raptor standing over Nut's body, Barbara says to Dick, you just let an innocent man die. Dick runs over punching Raptor, and then on the screen, the parliament watches, stating that they did a good job. Now the Bat family will know Nightwing's moral failing. The payment will be, but then Dick grabs Raptor and slams his head into the monitor. But before he can hit him again, he says, that's enough. From behind them, Nut gets up stating, did I do a good job? I tried real hard not to breathe. Dick asks, what's going on? And Raptor explains that he just used some of his fake blood that he keeps stored in his gauntlet. The problem with not feeling pain is that it's easy to bleed out. Raptor helps him up stating, here's the deal. The parliament thinks he's dead and we saved your life. So thank us. And why don't you hand over that blueprint in return? As the three of them leave, Barbara yells at Dick about how they're supposed to inspire fear into criminals, not help them play sick pranks and steal money. Dick tries to defend himself, but Barbara goes on stating that he pretended to be dead to infiltrate Spiral. Then he sold his soul to destroy the parliament of owls, swinging so far out it's like he doesn't want to come back. As she leaves, Dick asks Raptor why he didn't tell them sooner that he wanted to dismantle the parliament. And Raptor tells him, because earning trust is shown by actions, not words. I told you, everything Batman taught you is wrong. Dick asks, now what? And he tells him, we should stop by my home before we go back to Greece. A long time ago, the Court of the Owls needed a way to keep track of whoever they gave their coffer to. To do so, they hired a mad inventor to make the Book of Wisdom, unreadable to all but a select few. But in my home, I have Dr. Leviticus, the one who created the book. Once Dick and Raptor sit down, Dr. Leviticus explains that the Book of Wisdom is something that she did in fact create. But she's done other things like cure death, aging, even lactose intolerance. A long time ago, she found a way to bring the dead back using an alloy, an electrum, and the owls wanted to use that for its immortality. The book would mechanically store information from the patterns on the coins, but now the owls want her dead, well, more than dead, so she built a copy of the book as well. The only thing that they're all going to need are the coins. Later, Dick and Raptor are welcomed back to the Parliament Grove, the owl's labyrinth by the orator. He tells them that they did such a wonderful job, and he tells them that it's finally coming time to celebrate the birth of the Owl's new nation. A new nation needs their symbols, their gods, and these refugees will be the blood sacrifices. The festivities will begin in the morning. So until then, they're welcome to eat and drink. Once they're left alone, Dick says that he's done playing the long game. He's going to finish this tonight, and Raptor tells him, your instincts are right. We do it tonight. Later that night, the orator is woken up by a knock on the door, and when he opens it, he's told that Dick Grayson and Raptor freed the rats from their cages. He then asks them if they told any 
anyone else? And they say no. And then with a slash, the two are far dead, as the orator says that it could hurt his standing with the parliament, especially since he was recently promoted to God. Down in the labyrinth, Dick and Raptor led the captives out when suddenly the orator comes in crashing through the wall. He shouts that there will be sacrifices made of the innocent. And Dick says, that, that right there, that's what you've been betting on the entire time? Dick throws his baton at the wall, bouncing it off, hitting the orator in the eye. But he knocks him away and he slashes at his stomach. Suddenly a dart then hits the orator and he begins to fall over. Raptor helps Dick back up and he asks, what was that? And Raptor tells him, the orator's body has been conditioned to assimilate animal DNA. So I injected it with some animal DNA that I had lying around. That shark attractant. Raptor shouts for him to go before anyone notices, but when they turn the corner, Dick sees it. There in the center of the labyrinth is the box of coins. Dick grabs the box and Raptor tells him that he hopes he remembers how to get out because I'm having a real hard time right now thinking straight. Dick looks back and he sees a cut on Raptor's leg when the orator first attacked and Raptor's bleeding out. He begins to take off his gauntlet to give himself blood, but while Dick ties off the wound, the orator shouts that he's going to make Dick one of them. The two quickly get up and they begin running, but as they run to the exit, Raptor stops and says, I can't go on. I'm a wanted man. If I go out and escape with you, they'll just put me back in a cage. So go, take the coins and leave. And then Raptor places his hand on Dick's chest and he pushes him out the door. As he falls, Dick calls out, I'm ready for pickup, Tony! And the voice tells him, you should not be calling me that. A glider flies out and Dick catches it. And he safely floats down to awaiting spiral agents. However, what Dick doesn't know is that Raptor is still alive. Lady Eve of Cobra thanks him, telling him the coins work. The first names of the Parliament of Owls are coming through. And Raptor tells her the device that Dr. Leviticus made that Dick gave Spiral has a little back door. So every time they draw a name, so will she. Lady Eve then asks, what about Nightwing? And Raptor tells her, don't worry your pretty little head. I've got him wrapped around my finger. Our story begins in Sydney Tower in Sydney, Australia, as Dick heads out to meet with Tiger for a bust on the Parliament of the Owls. But as the two of them get ready to move in, they hear a scream, and then a giant cobra creature charges out of the doors. Dick fights it off, and Tiger looks at it, stating, I've never seen this before. It's a cobra convert, genetically enhanced assassin. Just then, Dick looks into the room where the owls were and sees them all dead. Seconds later, Tiger gets a call from headquarters, stating that they found something. It seems that the Book of Wisdom has a backdoor transmitter on it. Whenever they recovered a name from the coins, it seemed it got sent somewhere else as well. But before Tiger can question Dick about it, he sees Dick already jumped off the balcony. Later, over at Raptor's hideout, Raptor sees Dick and he offers him a beer. Dick tells him that he knows that he rigged the book. He knows that he used him! As Dick grabs him, Raptor pulls away, stating, Hey, I didn't murder anyone. I sold the names to Cobra and they donated the money to help refugees. Ones that the Parliament enslaved and exploited. Dick knocks Raptor through a wall, stating, It's not for you to decide! That's for the justice system! Raptor just laughs. Ha 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 ha! fighting back, stating, you're just going through Batman's version of justice. All that will happen is the rich bastards will get high-powered lawyers to help them get a slap on the wrist. He goes on stating, this is my kind of justice, the kind your mother would have wanted. The two continue punching back and forth, knocking each other through the walls until Raptor tells him, you see, I got all kinds of hobbies, and you're one of them. Dick looks up and he sees news articles from back when he was in the circus, everything that's happened to him since his parents died, and everything up to becoming Nightwing. Dick turns back and grabs Raptor by the collar, punching him repeatedly, telling him to take this mask off so he can see the real him then. Raptor manages to push him away, stating, I was gonna show you when you were ready, but now is not the time. And he pricks his neck. As Dick falls to his knees, Raptor goes on stating, all those things you got from Batman, Bruce Wayne, they all make you weaker. Dick reaches out, but then the drug takes over and he closes his eyes. All he can hear is Raptor stating, you just need everything taken away from you. Over in Gotham, Bruce Wayne gets ready to give a speech regarding their recent attack. But before he can get into it, a voice calls out to him from the crowd. The man asks, what do you have to say about the fact that the damage done to the city by the monsters is nothing compared to what you and the one percenters have done? Raptor then pulls his hood down and takes out the security guards, telling Bruce, what do you say about taking in orphans and stripping away their culture to make little extensions of yourself? He then pushes forward, grabbing Bruce by the neck, whispering, I know you're Batman, so how about we get along with this. Bruce clenches his fist, and then he releases it, allowing himself to be captured. Back at Raptor's hideout, Dick begins to wake up as Damien screams into the radio. He says that his father's been kidnapped, so if they hurry, but Dick tells him, I need to do this alone. This is more than me and Bruce. This is about Raptor and my mom. A little while later, Bruce sits up in his chair, strapped down as Raptor tells him how he completely disarmed him down to his laser cutting tool in his watch. Raptor goes on telling Bruce, you took Dick Grayson from his home, his people, and you raised him in a world of privilege. You turned him into a weapon for the rich against the poor and desperate. You ruined Dick Grayson, so it's time for Batman to face real justice. 
He continues stating, Even now, the people at Wayne Enterprises went to work making a cover of story, stating how Bruce Wayne shown willing submission to prove his selflessness to everyone. With that, Wayne Tech's stock price rose. And with this lift, once it reaches $200, you'll be dropped. But just before he presses the button, a crack can be heard, and Raptor catches one of Dick's batons. He tells him, it's time for your final. But then a second one flies in, hitting Raptor right in the head, cracking his mask. And he says, fine, it's only fair seeing the eyes that have watched you all of these years. Dick runs in, uppercutting Raptor, and then he runs over to check on Bruce. But Raptor tells him, no, this is what they want. And he hits the switch. Bruce's chair suddenly launches into the air out of Dick's reach. And then he knocks Dick away, going on about how this is what they want. They want to break the poor down so that they'll come running and worship the rich, offering everything to them. The two continue going at it, and Raptor starts to overpower Dick. But as they fight, Raptor continues to talk about how even with his disease, the government wouldn't help the poor with drugs. Even after everyone left, there was one who came by and picked him up. It was Dick's mother, Mary, and the two of them stole the medicine that was supposed to be given to them, as well as whatever else they felt that they wanted from the mayor's home. So from then on, he always watched from the shadows to protect her, till she was killed by a selfish man who didn't get money that wasn't his. Dick then smiles, stating, I was mad at you for all the doubt and pain you caused, but it's really you who's in more pain than me, isn't it? You loved my mother, and when she died, you blamed yourself until you could finally blame someone else. Dick grabs a pipe, cracking Raptor across the face, stating, The thing with Bruce, though, is that he raised me to not be like him. We saved each other so that I wouldn't cross into the shadows like you have. Raptor picks himself up, telling Dick to shut up. You don't even know me. You're right. I don't even know your real name. Raptor starts to swing, and Dick tells him, You don't have to do this. I know you don't feel pain, but... Dick then breaks his arms and legs, leaving him there so that he can go save Bruce. Back at the lift, Bruce tries to pick the lock as the stock price continues to rise. Though he picks it to get up, he has nowhere to go. He begins to let go as the chair begins to fall, and Dick swings in, grabbing him before he hits the ground. A little while later, Tiger shows up stating that Raptor has a pretty clever device, so they're gonna confiscate it. But since Raptor's wanted in 17 countries, Tiger can forgive Dick for his hasty exit back in Sydney. Tiger then turns to Bruce, stating, just in case Raptor says some nonsense about him being Batman, they have the technology that can make him change his mind. Dick and Bruce watch as Tiger takes off, and he tells Bruce that this is all his fault. He almost got him killed. He almost fell. But Bruce puts his hand on Dick's shoulder, telling him, You didn't. I jumped. I jumped because I knew that you would catch me. It was a late night in Bloodhaven as Paul sits in his office on a call regarding the most recent weapon shipment to a client. As a buzz at the back door and Paul tells his client to hang on a second, his takeout just arrived. As he opens the door, he doesn't see anyone and then he's suddenly pulled out. The man on the phone begins asking if everything's okay, but all he can do is hear Paul screaming. The next morning, Dick heads over to Bloodhaven Community Center to apply as a counselor. As he sits in the office, Sean Sang says that his resume looks really good, but her only question is, why did he come here from Gotham? It's rare for people from Gotham to make their way here, let alone apply for volunteer positions. Dick thinks about it, and he wants to tell her that he's here so that he can work on trusting people again. With the things that he's done and the people that he's met, people have died and he's begun to question his own judgment. But rather than stating that, he says that it's because of that new tourist campaign. It really got his blood up. Get it? <laughs> he laughs, stating that he's sorry for the bad jokes, but Sean tells him that it's okay. She tends to get a little suspicious with everyone. Real bad habit. She then extends her arm, welcoming him to the long hours, zero pay, and non-existent bed. Benefits. As the two go on, there's a knock at the door as James Nice introduces himself and says that he's sorry that he needs to borrow Sean for a quick meeting. James tells Dick that if he's looking for something to do tonight, there's plenty of after dark entertainment in blood. As Dick leaves, he says that he appreciates it, but he's not really much for the nightlife. He heads off and James turns back to Sean, telling her that he really just wanted to talk to her about tonight. He thinks it's time to wear the costumes. Sean says that she's not really sure they're ready for it, but James tells her that they've already lost Grace. It could be something to help face their monsters together for her. Later, Dick begins setting up his new apartment and he enjoys the life of not having to put a costume on in the evening. As 8.30 turns to 8.40, Dick realizes that this could actually get pretty boring. While laying in bed, he hears the sounds of sirens and decides that maybe just this once he'll go out. Surely he can figure himself out on a single night anyway. After suiting up, Dick listens to the police scanner to hear that there have been reports of a murder of Paul Petreno, who was brutally beaten and had his bones broken in 39 places. The report goes on to state that the strength used to beat him was inhuman. Dick lands on a nearby building and he hears something from the shadows. Gorilla Grim jumps out ready to attack. Dick tells himself that he knows who this is. Him and Batman kicked this gorilla's butt on more than one occasion. 
mansion, but it's strange that he would show up here in Bloodhaven. Dick easily dodges the attacks and he pins Grimm down as the police arrive. And Grimm shouts, he didn't do it! He's trying to stay clean! That's why he came to this city! As the officers pick up Gorilla Grimm, one tells Dick, thanks for the assist, but they are only going to be nice this once. They don't deal with the tight types around here in Bloodhaven. But before the officers can take him away, Grimm pulls away telling Dick that he's gotta do something. Go talk to Sean Sang! She'll know what to do! And as he says that, the officer tases him and takes him away. A little while later, over at the community center, Sean tells herself that that they're going to be here soon. She can do this. And the door to her office suddenly opens up as Dick walks in stating, hey, we need to talk. As she turns around shouting, Nightwing? And that's when Dick sees that Sean is another one of his old villains, the Defacer. She shouts for him to get out of there because she would rather not hear anything that he has to say. He could ruin everything that the runoffs have worked so hard for. And as Dick begins to question who, Stallion charges through the door, knocking Dick to the ground. He grabs onto Stallion's hand and he throws him into a mirror. And Sean runs over telling Stallion to calm down. Don't do anything stupid. Remember all that we've done in group. Remember the man on the inside. Stallion looks at one of the broken shards in the mirror and he says that he's done it again. Why can't he get this through his thick skull? Sean tries to comfort him and then tells Dick, look at what you've done. These people came here to get away from Batman and all of the others. Another voice tells everyone to calm down and James walks in with the other runoffs explaining, Nightwing, this is a support group for former supervillains of Gotham. Sean starts pulling Dick away, telling everyone it's all right. Nightwing was stopping by just by mistake. Mouse then speaks up, stating that maybe since he's here, he can help them with the conspiracy. Dick asks, what did she mean? And Sean pushes Dick out, telling him, you've already caused enough trouble here. As Dick is leaving, he thinks about how these people are terrified at just the sight of him. But then again, that's how everyone treats you when you're with the Bat family. Once outside, James runs out asking Dick to wait. He just wanted to tell him something before he can go. All of the people here are because of Nightwing, and they do need help. The police don't listen to them, but they would listen to Nightwing. They already lost grace to the Whale Enders gang. Dick tells him no. He just recently got wrapped up with a criminal and... But James stops him, telling him that he too was on the wrong path, but the runoff saved him. So maybe they can save Nightwing as well. Dick says fine, he'll help, but after that he's gonna walk. And then he asks if there's anything that they noticed different about Grimm. James says that Grimm was trying, but he did have relapses. The other night, he was at Meadowdale Mall, where nothing good ever happens. Dick decides to head over there to find that it is actually an illegal street market, though the cops do nothing so long as the residents stay away from the boardwalk in the city. After a bit of asking around, Dick finds a woman who Grimm used to hire. He pays her and asks how did that work, and she tells him to get his mind out of the gutter. He just liked to act out little scenarios, like King Kong kind of things. Said it helped him remain secure to his gorilla hood. She tells Dick that she can show him where Grimm lives for a little extra. The woman's directions lead to the old whaler's dock where Grimm lived in one of the shipping containers. As Dick looks around, he notices a shipping building that has security cameras on it, which could possibly place him here at the time of the murder. He sneaks in to check out the security footage, but he sees that the tapes at the time of the murder are currently signed out. The record records show that it wasn't the police who took it. The person who did smeared their name with some sort of liquid that smells like horses. As the sun rises, Dick decides that it's best to just call it a night. And the next night, Sean tells the rest of the runoffs to have a good night as they leave their meeting. Through the shadows, Dick steps out, stating that he wanted to wait until they were gone, and Sean says that's nice of him. But maybe they are not just the only ones who's been traumatized. Dick tells her that he knows. Back then, he was wearing a different set of shorts when he first met her and arrested her. But right now, he's here because he needs to talk to someone. He goes on stating that he's having a lot of trouble trusting people, and it feels like he may be a lot like the runoffs. Really, what he's trying to state is that he feels Grimm is innocent, and he's going to help him whether they like it or not, because helping the runoffs could help him too. Sean tells him back when she was taken away by the police, she was so mad at him that she couldn't see it, but the look in his eyes was something like, what if they had met under different circumstances? Dick says, like, what if it were just us? And she leans in, telling him, yeah. But the sirens begin to blare as two police cars pull up, and they tell Sean that they would like her to come with them, as she's currently a suspect in a murder. Dick tries to stop them, but Sean tells him that he'll figure this out. One of the officers then pushes Dick back, telling him that he can go back to Gotham. This is the job for the real police. No ad campaigns, as he points to a billboard that has Nightwing on it. A little while later, Detective Elise arrives at the most recent crime scene of Robert Chapman, with Defacer's tag sprayed all over the place. But before she can even drink her coffee, Dick appears behind her stating that they need to talk. And he's a little sorry for scaring her. She tells him it's all right, that coffee was crap anyway, but he is contaminating a crime scene. He looks around and asks, why would it matter? They've already taken their photos and decided that it was Sean Sung. Elise says, well, given the circumstances here, this is her work. But as Dick finishes up and gets ready to leave, he tells her that that might be an easy way to look at it. But if she looks harder, she'll find that something isn't right. After leaving the crime scene, he heads over to James Nice's house to let him know what happened to Sean. And he asks, how did Nightwing know where he lived? 
And Dick tells him, I am a detective, you know. After explaining the situation, Dick then says that someone is setting up the runoffs, so they need to have a meeting tomorrow night. James tells him that that won't be a problem, and then it asks Dick if he remembers when he said that he came from a dark place. Six years ago, James was driving with his girlfriend, and he was using a lot of drugs, and he ended up crashing their car. Though he walked away, Jamie didn't, and his case was thrown out over a technicality, even though he was guilty of killing her. He then says that he knows that he volunteers to help the runoffs, but what if... They weren't innocent. Dick tells him that when Sean was taken, he saw the look in her face and it wasn't guilt, it was faith. The next night, everyone decides to gather up and Dick tells everyone, thanks for coming to meet me. But Stallion stops him, telling him, we're here for Sean and Grimm, not you. Dick decides to tell everyone that's fine, but right now, they're gonna need to tell him everything about this conspiracy. As everyone speaks up, they all explain how a few weeks ago, Grimm was approached by Paul for a job, which Grimm took. When Grimm went to the meeting, it involved a crew of Bloodhaven businessmen. Paul, for the import-export trade, Robert Chapman as the mob lawyer, and Carter Forsyth, who handled real estate. While Paul was handling the arms trafficking, Carter laundered the money through his business, and soon they made contact with Robert's contacts, the second hand. But there was also a fourth silent partner who was upset about missing the shipment. Dick tells everyone that with this information, he needs to go find Carter because he has to know something. But before leaving, Stallion says that he'll go with them to make sure that he doesn't get stomped on. And Mouse speaks up stating, Nightwing, you're like us for leaving Gotham. So right now, you're one of the runoffs. Over at Carter's construction site, Carter begins packing up his paperwork, telling his assistants that they need to hurry. Then there's a sudden thump at the door and Stallion punches it down, telling everyone, Howdy! Carter shouts, asking if he knows who he is, and Dick with the rest of the runoff steps in, stating that he's the guy who's going to be telling them who killed Paul and Robert. Dick grabs him and Carter says that it wasn't him. That's why he's trying to get the hell out of here. If he didn't notice, he's shaking here. Then there's another thump and the trailer begins to shake, knocking everyone down. A voice tells Dick that he shouldn't have come here, and as Orca picks him up, she tells him, Here be the sea monster! Dick remembers that this is actually Grace Balin, a marine biologist who sliced her own DNA with that of a killer whale to repair a spinal cord injury. But as Dick dodges a forklift thrown at him, he's hit in the back of the head with a pipe by one of Whale Ender's gang members. Grace gets ready to attack, but Stallion jumps on her, telling Dick that he better be quick because he can't hold her for long. While Grace tries to get Stallion off, Dick fights off the gang members as Juan rides up on his bike. Grace manages to throw Stallion off, and Mouse jumps in to try and stop her, but as Grace catches her and tosses her to the other side, Dick runs in to protect her, and Grace starts beating down on him. Through her punches, Giz's squirrel runs up Grace's back with a pair of headphones, and then there's a booming screeching sound. Grace falls to her knees, and Juan asks, what was that? And Giz says that he just played the sound of an air gun at 300 decibels. As the fight ends, Juan mentions that his bike is missing, along with Carter. Elsewhere in an alley, Carter runs off, but someone on Juan's bike, wearing Juan's mask, runs him over. Dick and the runoffs quickly manage to find Carter, but it's already too late. As everyone turns around, Carter suddenly begins coughing, and Dick shouts, he's alive! Juan says that he has some first aid on him, and Carter tells him that that isn't going to do much. He then says that he didn't get a look at who it was, but there's one more of them. They need to hurry and stop the murderer before they get their silent partner, Mayor Madrigal. And then Carter slumps over as he draws his last breath. Dick tells everyone that they did a good job with Grace back there. Now they just need to go to, but Mouse stops them, stating no one is going to help them. People are just going to see them as villains, and the runoffs leave. Over at Bloodhaven PD, Elise sits with Sean, telling her that even though she feels the police force don't need help, something Nightwing told her is strange. The positions of all of the recent victims' heads were all turned to the left, and after some digging in the past five years, the solved murders all had their victims' heads turned to the left as well. And right now, it seems like they may actually have a killer running the streets. Over at the mayor's office, Madrigal looks out his office building when he notices the cops arriving there. He tells the person on the phone that he's gonna have to call them back when there's a sudden flash of light. The officers on the ground see the flash and they ask what it could be and another one says that he's not sure but someone called in with an anonymous tip that the mayor was in danger. They then watch as Dick crashes into the office and they ask if they think that it could be him. Once Dick gets up he looks over at the mayor to see someone holding him wearing a robin mask. The man holding the mayor then turns away blasting at Dick. Dick dodges the attack and he runs up hitting the man's arm holding the device that he just used. As he beats him down, he says that he knows where all of the missing weapons went. The gauntlets made him as strong as a gorilla. The teletube allowed him to move from scene to scene, and right now, he's trying to frame him, Nightwing. As the two struggle, the man extends a mechanical arm, grabbing the mayor and pushing him out the window. Dick runs over to the window, but then he sees Sean fly by, grabbing a hold of him. The man runs over, grabbing Dick by the back of the head, telling him that he just let an evil man get away. The guilty must be punished. As the man throws Dick aside, Dick manages to grab the mask, ripping it off. And as the city advertisers run into the office, 
as everyone looks over to see James Nice. The officers all begin charging into the room, telling everyone to get down, but James grabs the female advertiser and Teletubes out of there. The officers shout for Dick not to move, but he runs and jumps out the window as the officers open fire on him. After ducking away into an alley, a hand reaches out grabbing him, and Sean tells him to get over here. She tells him that she dropped the mayor off, and it looks like someone's been setting them all up. Dick says that he knows who it is. It's James. But how did she get here? And then Dick hears a click of a gun and Elise says that she owed him. But he also owes her some coffee. So how about they go for a ride? A short while later, Elise is driving Sean, telling an officer that she needs to go ahead and drop their suspect off at their arraignment. As she drives off, Sean asks Elise if they can just let Dick back in, and she says no. They can't have him be seen. He needs to stay under the car for now. During the ride, Elise asks Sean how does she know where to go, and Sean says that James handled their budgets for the community center. There was money moved around, but there was a property purchased listed as a quiet reflection project. The strange thing was, why would anyone buy property to relax in an industrial wasteland like Rail Peninsula? Meanwhile, in that building at the Rail Peninsula, the woman Sherry asks, where are they? James tells her that she's the head of the tourism department. She should know, but just know that they are far away from that superhero that she's putting up on the billboards. Sherry says that she told him about the corruption of the mayor and the others. She helped him, and James tells her that she did help him, but she too is guilty. He changes masks, and Sherry grabs an energy drink, stating that she had this flavor called Winter Cherry, which is funny because of her name. And then she splashes it onto James's face. He fires a few blasts, but Cherry gets up and runs. Not long after that, Dick and Sean make their way into the facility and they find Cherry trying to escape. Sean says that it looks like she's about to fall over, but Dick catches her and Cherry says that she'll be fine. She just needs a little pick-me-up energy drink. She takes it out and says, forgive the smell. Someone says that it smells like, and Dick finishes her sentence stating, horses. He then says that she's the one from the ledger. And Cherry says that she's sorry. Once everything started, she didn't know how to stop him. She then goes on stating that all of the recent advertising with Nightwing on the billboards was for him to try and save Bloodhaven from her and James. James jumps out of the teletube telling her that it's too late. Nothing can save her now. Dick jumps in the way to block James's attack, but James punches and knocks him away. Sean runs up grabbing James, telling him that she never really did like him anyway. But as James struggles, he picks her up and he slams her against the wall. He raises his blaster to strike Sean, but then a grappling hook catches it and pulls it back. Dick shouts for Sean to get Sherry out of there, and James runs in, tackling Dick into the teletube. As the two of them pop out, James says that this is where it all happened. This is where his girlfriend died. He then cracks Dick in the head with a blaster, stating that all he had to do was pay the officer who arrived, so no one would punish him. And because of that, he had to punish all of them. James then holds a mirror down to Dick's face, telling him, everyone has to look at the monster in the mirror. So what is it that Nightwing's guilty of? Dick says that he's guilty of trusting people like him. And then he looks in the mirror and he sees a human, one who makes mistakes, one who tries to do better. Dick tries to pick himself back up, stating that maybe he should look into his own reflection. And Elise's voice shouts for James to freeze, but as James turns back, he charges up to fire another blast. Elise fires her gun and the bullet hits the blaster, causing the blaster to backfire, blowing shards of glass into James's face. James screams out of pain and he trips over the ledge of the bridge. But before falling, Dick runs over there and catches him. A little while later, the news crew shows up and Elise tells the news that the officers here single-handedly took down the villains. She just wants to tell the people of Bloodhaven that they are safe from crime without the help of superheroes. The next day after the group session, Dick goes to see Sean to help her with moving her things. She says that even though she was released, it seems like public service didn't like the idea that she was a murder suspect. Dick tells her that he'll do anything he can to get her back in as soon as possible. And they both look up at the billboard of Nightwing being taken down, and Sean says that she's gonna miss seeing that guy around. Dick thinks how he wants to say that he is Nightwing, and that he's not leaving, because he wants her to know who he really is. But as he walks off, he just says, yeah, Nightwing's all right. Sean grabs Dick by the arm, telling him don't be stupid, and kisses him. She then says that when she got arrested, he saw her for who she was back then as Robin. And she can do the same for him. So with things settled, Dick figures that he'll stick around as Nightwing and Bloodhaven, even if it is more in the shadows. And as the night sets and he swings off in his patrol, a man watches, stating that it looks like he decided to stay. Too bad there's only room in this city for one of them. Late at night, Dick and Sean kiss hanging off of a flagpole. And Dick thinks that the only bad thing about hanging a hundred feet above ground or so, actually there's nothing wrong about kissing Sean. After setting her back down in her apartment, Dick tells Sean that he just received a call about a robbery in progress. He's gotta go spank some bad guys. He swings off and Sean tells him, wait, she's been bad too. So Dick just laughs, telling her that he'll save some for her then. As he hurries off, she sighs, stating that maybe then they can talk. Earlier that morning in San Francisco at Titan's Tower, the Titans lounge around and Beast Boy tells Damien that he seems a bit distracted. 
As Damien grabs a handful of peanuts, he says, Don't be ridiculous. I'm just seeing what people are saying about me on Chipper. He flips through the feeds and he sees people praising him for taking over the Teen Titans. But then the conversation switches to Nightwing as being the better Robin, and how he should have been the one to take up Batman's mantle. And then the tags, hashtag the original Robin and hashtag best Robin, start trending. And Damien begins to shout, What is this? He jumps up, asking the rest of the Teen Titans if Batman was to ever retire, who would they assume is going to take the mantle? And they all think about it and say, probably Nightwing. Damien then throws his phone on the ground, shattering it, and he tells everyone that he'll be back. He has an appointment in Bloodhaven. Back in Bloodhaven, Dick responds to the robbery call, finding the four men wearing horse masks, posed as the four horsemen, robbing an armored truck. It doesn't take Dick long to take the group down, but as one of them manages to get back up, he's suddenly kicked by a green boot. Damien says, Batman of Bloodhaven, huh? And Dick shouts, it's so good to see! What brings you to town? Damien scoffs, it's certainly not the caliber of criminals. He then goes on saying that he's heard of what he's doing here with his old enemies. So if he's planning on becoming Batman, he's getting off to a poor start. Dick tells him to give him just a second. He, he missed a call and afterwards they can talk. As Dick listens, it's a message from Sean stating that she didn't want to ruin the mood or anything, but she's late. Like, really late. Dick's eyes widen as the message plays and at the end, Sean tells Dick to come over when he gets a chance and bring a pregnancy test. Dick hangs up the phone and Damien goes on asking if he really thinks that he can take the mantle from him and steal his legacy. And Dick doesn't answer and he says, uh, gotta go. Damien grabs his shoulder so Dick flips him to the ground telling him that he doesn't have time for a Robin meltdown. You're a self-absorbed 13 year old with raging hormones and I really need to go now. Dick then hooks onto a building and he jumps off telling Damien to just wait for the cops. I'll meet you at my apartment in an hour. A few moments later, Dick sneaks back into Sean's apartment telling her, hey, the only guy who comes through your living room window is here. And as he walks through the apartment, she doesn't answer. So he calls out saying, okay, not answering me is really starting to freak me out now. And then he sees Sean's phone on the ground. When he tries to pick it up, he looks into her studio and sees one of her paintings with the word daddy spray painted across it. A short while later, Damien crawls through the same window that Dick entered in, and he says that he didn't know the address, so he just followed. And, but before Damien can get very far, he sees Dick crying on the ground. And through his tears, he quietly says, she's gone. Damien walks up telling him that he scouted the place like he normally does when he enters, and there was no signs of a break-in. And judging by the painting, she's the artistic type, so typically flighty and always chasing drama. Dick hands over the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood book that he gave Sean, and he tells Damien that he's 13 and doesn't know what he's talking about. Dick leaves thinking that whoever took Sean left the coordinates inside of the book, and the coordinates lead to Richard the Lionheart's grave over in France. As Dick lands on a building, Damien tells him, I'm coming with, and Dick tells him that he's not. I'm not dealing with another hissy fit, so Damien stops him telling him, Our worlds have changed. Drake is gone, Duke is in the mansion, and I'm stationed in San Francisco with the Titans. However, the one thing that's the same is your attitude, and you're gonna get yourself killed to that help. Dick tells him, fine, but I have one question. Did you steal the old Batmobile? And Damien tells him, indeed I did. Now let's get going. However, back with the four robbers, the man from before wearing Dick's old costume kills the men, stating that this broken city needed Nightwing. And now a broken Nightwing needs Deathwing. Later, as the two of them reach Western France, they begin their investigation to find that the coordinates have brought them to the tomb of Richard I. He was a real-life king who often had roles in Robin Hood's storylines. The problem is, no one's there. Damien scans one of the tombs and he says that someone is inside. So Dick tries to push Damien away and Damien pushes back telling him to wait! Based on the temperature variations, whoever is in that tomb has no face. Suddenly a voice shouts that they do have a face! It's the face of Dick Grayson! The face of Deathwing! The man wearing Dick's old costume jumps out of the tomb, grabbing Damien stating that he knew that he would come. You would do what I would do, just not as well. Dick starts to fight against Deathwing, trying to free Damien, but Deathwing used Damien as a shield when Dick throws his punches. After cracking an elbow into Deathwing's face, Dick finally frees Damien and he tells him that he needs to get back. Deathwing pulls out his batons, but at the end of them are blades, and he runs through slashing at Dick's back. Damien tries to attack, but Deathwing knocks him away into the tomb that they just came out of. Dick gets back up, trying to get a hold of Damien, but Deathwing kicks him in the face, stabbing the blades from the batons into the tomb, breaking them off and nailing the lid shut. Dick charges into Deathwing's back asking, who are you? Who made you think that you were Nightwing and where's Sean? As Dick slams his batons into Deathwing's skull, Deathwing reaches back at Dick's face, stating that Sean has nothing to do with this. She's just the last thing standing in my way of making Nightwing become Deathwing. Dick gets back up shouting, you're delusional, programmed. Tell me where Sean is and I can help. But as Dick charges back at Deathwing, Deathwing says, I can't tell you. I can only show you what's to come. He grazes Dick's forehead with a small dagger and suddenly Dick's eyes go wide. Dick begins to see him 
but different versions of him, some good and some bad. He tries to speak, asking where's Sean, but his words trail off. Deathwing raises the dagger, telling Dick to become the man that he's become. You're gonna have to suffer loss and fall farther than the ground, farther than hell. But before Deathwing can plunge the dagger down, a voice shouts no. Another person in an old Robin costume kicks Deathwing, telling him, not while Robin lives. Damien runs up shouting, that fool nailed the lid down, but he compromised the structural integrity. Though the same could not be said about your forehead. Dick can hardly say anything in his current state of mind, and he asks, who are you? And Damien says, it's me, you fool. Where have you been? On the other side of the room, Deathwing picks himself up, telling the fake Robin, You're a mistake! Even he said so! You don't have his blood! The fake Robin pulls out the blade of batons, telling him, No, but I will! Damien starts shaking Dick, telling him to snap out of it. He's Damien, Robin to his Batman. We're the greatest team ever! Finding a new partner, considering having a child to replace me, I don't want to be alone! I need you! Dick slowly starts to come out of it asking, what happened? And Damien tells him, nothing, nothing happened. But this is insanity. The two see Deathwing ready to kill the fake Robin and they rush over knocking him out, freeing him. Dick reaches down to help the fake Robin up stating that there's no need to fight. And the fake Robin begins to remove the skin mask saying, of course not, we simply lose. As the mask comes off, the boy says that his name is Danish and his father was a truck driver. No, his name is Damien Wayne and his father is Batman. After looking at the fake Robin's face, Dick knew who made these Dala Otron copies of him and Damien. Sean was kidnapped by one of the sickest minds that him and Damien have ever encountered, Professor Pig. A short while later in another part of Paris, Professor Pig stands with Sean shouting to his Dalotrons, Soon, we will have a new addition to the gallery. One of the Dalotrons breaks their glasses, grabbing the sharp edges and begins walking towards Sean. When suddenly there's a voice calling out to Pig. What do we do with little piggies, Nightwing? We make them squeal all the way home. Dick and Damien crash through one of the windows and they begin taking out the Dalotrons. But while the two of them handle the Dalotrons, Pig turns back to Sean and begins to pull out a small blade and he gets ready to thrust it down onto her. Dick Pig calls out to her, but then a battering is thrown, cutting her ropes. Just as Pig swings, Sean steps out of the way and trips him. Dick tells Damien, thanks, and Damien responds, telling him, it's only practical, I am the better shot. Meanwhile outside, the fake Robin watches over Deathwing, and Deathwing asks, are you enjoying the show down there, you little backstabber? The fake Robin asks, how did you? And Deathwing tells him, it's the acid and the Dalotron masks that Pig gave us. Tape really doesn't stand a chance. Just imagine what it's going to do to our real faces. The fake Robin then asks, Asks, so you know. Deathwing says, I know that you lived your life as Damian Wayne, the son of Batman. But before that, you were someone else. The fake Robin says, yeah, I was the son of a truck driver from Manchester. Whatever Pig did to us, it did not erase all of what I was. I remember going to school, playing football with my brother Tariq, and I remember my father. So what can you remember? Deathwing looks down telling him, I don't remember. All I remember is that I was a failure. Deathwing starts to hit the back of his head against the stone wall as the fake Robin tells him that he has to fight for himself, fight to remember who he was. And after a few hits, Deathwing asks, where am I? Why am I tied up? Tanish, please help. Tanish then cuts the ropes telling him, you're free now, free to remember who you were. And Deathwing tells him, yes. I had a purpose, not to make Dick Grayson better, but to be better. And he starts to choke Dinesh. Back inside, Sean sprays Pig in the face with paint. He kicks him in the groin, finally putting an end to the fight. Dick shouts on the floor, are you all right? And Sean asks if that was the Robin that he's talking about because she thought that he would be taller. As the two hug, Damien turns back saying, blah. However, as she looks out, she sees Damien taking off and rushes out. Dick asks, where is he going? And Damien says, you just wanted your girl. Well, now you got her, so stay here. Once outside, Damien runs down the alleyway shouting, only I can steal the Batmobile. And then he feels a rock hit him in the back of the head. Deathwing calls down, telling him that it's a neat trick having it voice activated. Since I'm a dead match for Nightwing. Deathwing jumps down, but before Damien can attack, he sees Danish's bloody mask. Damien shouts, he was just a child. You're going to pay for that with your life. But before Damien can even finish his sentence, there's a gunshot and Damien falls to the ground. A shadowy figure walks over telling them that there is only one path by which Richard Grayson will reach his true potential. Robin dies at dawn. A short while later, Dick and Sean head out to look for Damien, but that's when they see Danish's body in the trash pile. Dick turns and slams Pig into a wall asking, what's going on? Where's Robin? And Pig says that there's another patron. I was his physician made of pain. He is Dr. Simon Hurt. 
A few days later, over in Egypt, Dick and Sean are on a guided tour. Dick says that he can't wait to see the sunrise over the ruins, and the guide laughs, telling him that they will see things that they will remember for the rest of their lives. Suddenly, thieves jump out of the sand, and Dick starts to take the men out. One of the men pulls out a knife, but after still suffering an injury from fighting Pig, he trips and falls. Just as the man can strike down, Sean runs up and kicks him with a blast from her rocket shoes. The thief flies off, and then the guide crawls away, but Dick grabs him, telling him, that was a pretty crappy tour. Tour. He goes on telling the guide, I'm a superhero and I would never threaten someone's life for information. She's the defacer though. She's a genuine supervillain. Sean holds the rocket over the man's face and asks, where can they find Dr. Hurt? After tying the rest of the men up, the two jump down a hidden shaft and Sean quotes the Robin Hood book, Hope be it ever so faint, bringeth a gleam into darkness. Dick asks, so you read it? And Sean tells him that she understands where he got his hokey goody goody worldview. It told her a lot about how he looks up to old fashioned heroes and what they stand for. And he would make a good role model as well as a good father. Sean goes on saying that that's why she's here for him and Robin. She needs to know that she would stand up for something and it would be for good moments. As the two walk down into the temple, Dick says that she's always standing up, but then there's a sudden crash. One of the statues falls over where Sean was walking and Dick shouts, no, 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 no! Deathwing calls out that she only kept him from reaching his fully realized form. So that is why he had to drop a statue on her. Dick manages to kick Deathwing back, and as he does, he runs over to where the statue fell. Sean holds the statue from falling, holding out her legs, pushing it back with her rocket boots. Dick holds up the statue, and as he does, he can feel his ankle being crushed. After letting the statue down, Deathwing runs away, hacking at Dick, telling him, That's the difference between us! Nightwing has a weakness! Deathwing doesn't! Dick pulls out his knife that was used on him, and he charges at Deathwing, telling him, You're not a better version of me, you're just a failed me. The two crash into the stone pillar as the knife cuts into Deathwing's face, and then Deathwing drops to the ground shouting, I'm sorry! Please don't hit me! Sean runs over to check on him and says that whatever the knife did to him back then, it's doing that to Deathwing right now. He's just another lost child. She then tells Dick to go ahead. She'll stay here with Deathwing, and Dick tells her that Deathwing can't be trusted. Sean looks back and says, look at him. He's lost, alone, and scared. This is what I do. Dick decides that he's going to push on ahead, thinking about how Dr. Hurt is just trying to make him hate himself, experience an array of tragedies to see what he could have been. Dick then walks down the hallway where he finds more Dolotrons, all dressed as versions of him, pointing and telling him, come see, come see. Dick steps into the altar room and shouts at Dr. Hurt, they got here before dawn. Dr. Hurt steps aside, showing Damien on the altar, holding up a bloody knife, telling him, sadly, I tend to jump the gun when I'm excited. Dick shouts for Damien and he runs at him and as he does, Dick begins to fall through the ground and Dr. Hurt tells him to awaken, fall into a hell of hells, and if he's strong enough, crawl back to his body. As Dick starts to get lost in his own mind, Dr. Hurt says, you will live this tragedy over and over so that you can become a finely tempered weapon if you are to survive the dawn that is to come. Back outside, Deathwing begins to scream and Sean asks, what's wrong? Is there something that I can call you besides Deathwing? And Deathwing tells her that he doesn't remember much from before, but why is she here helping him? He attacked her and vandalized her paintings. Sean says that even if that is true, he's a victim like the Dolotrons. Deathwing goes on saying that there is one thing that he remembers, and before this he was no one. He chose to do this. He jumps up grabbing the dagger, shouting that for the things that he did to Dinesh, he needs to die. Sean grabs him by the shoulder, telling him that she knows how he feels. She was hurt once too, but now she owns who she is and atones for it. He can do the same. Inside Dick's mind, Dick stands over a beaten pig, telling him, This will end my pain. But before he can strike down, a battering is thrown from a helmet wearing Nightwing. Nightwing begins hitting Dick Grayson, telling him that he won't let him kill Pig. So Dick Grayson jumps on top of Nightwing, beating into his face, shouting, You can't be Nightwing! Playing a hero means you lose everyone, including yourself! Now die! And as Dick looks down at the broken helmet, he sees Damien. He shouts back that it's just another trick, but before he can punch down, Damien grabs his hand. He asks if this is really what he wants to become, a pathetic mockery of what he once was. Damien starts to hit Dick, shouting, guilt, fear, there are anchors dragging you down. And the more Dick tries to fight back, the more Damien beats down on him. As Dick sits broken, Damien tells him that he needs to remember what he first said when they met. Remember! And Dick says, you're right, I've been hurt. I've lost the people that I've loved. But that's not what makes a Robin. Dick cracks Dr. Hurt in the face yelling, I will never let myself be defined by tragedy. And Sean's voice calls out to Dick. But when he turns back, Sean says that Robin, he's still alive. Dick runs over to the altar yelling for Damien to wake up. 
Damien looks over and he struggles as he tells Dick, You're an idiot. I was simply in a deep trance repairing the damage. Sean says, But he stabbed you, like in death parts. And Damien begins to get up telling him, It's only a flesh wound. All I did was simply contract my muscles to move my liver out of the way. And Dick shouts, You could do that? Dr. Hurt then starts to pull a gun telling them, No! Robin will be no use in the days to come. He's too stubborn and proud of his father. Then a voice tells him that that reminds him of a kid that he met named Dinesh. Deathwing appears out of nowhere, punching Dr. Hurt, and Hurt spins back, hitting him with the pistol, shouting that he is nothing more than a pathetic creature, nothing more than a dry run. Deathwing pulls out the dagger from before, stating that he thought that he could fix a broken Nightwing, but being Nightwing fixed a broken him. Deathwing thrusts the dagger into Hurt, and Hurt shouts that he won't be back alone. He will drag him down as well. He pulls out his own knife, and he stabs it into Deathwing's chest. Before the others can help, the temple begins to shake and crumble, and the three of them, Sean, Dick Grace, and Damian Wayne all escape outside. Seconds after the escape, everyone watches the underground temple collapse on itself and Sean asks, where did Dr. Hurt and Deathwing go? A few days later, in Bloodhaven, Sean tells Dick that the pregnancy test came back negative. But for now, she will still need a little space alone. And as the night sets, Dick and Damian look out onto the city and Damian says that he's going to be coming back soon. His father confiscated the Batmobile. Damian goes on telling him, I was wrong and yes, I'm admitting that I made a mistake by coming here as I did. Perhaps I was just looking for an excuse to... And Dick smiles, telling him, Aw, you just missed me. And Damien tells him, If you tell anyone that, I will bring a thousand hells upon you, Dick Grayson. Dick laughs. <laughs> Fine, I'll tell you a secret too. Back when Bruce returned, there was a moment when I thought that maybe it would have been better to keep you as my partner. But I was too young then. I was too afraid that I would be bad at being a dad. But now, before he can finish, the radios go off that there's a break-in at the bank, and Dick asks if he's up for a little action before he goes. Damien tells him, Indeed, pity these miscreants. The heir to the mantle of the Batman and the original Robin are here for them. Over on the streets of Bloodhaven Boardwalk, though, Roland Desmond takes his time walking to work, enjoying the bright lights of the town. As he walks up to Marcus Casino, he sees a homeless woman picking through the trash, and he asks if she's found anything good. She tells him that something big must be coming. Lots of jitters and nervous stomachs. Nobody finished their fancy club sandwiches. As she starts to eat, a tourist walks by bumping into Roland, and continues walking like nothing happened. Roland stares at the woman, his veins about to burst, and after squirting a drop into his mouth, his body turns back to normal. He starts to take out his wallet and gives the homeless woman and some money, telling her that she used to always chase his underage self out of clubs, but she always looked the other way when he was lightening some customers' pockets. A short while later, Roland walks around the casino to find a rather lucky man winning all of his hands at blackjack. Roland tells the man that he must be from out of town, and the man says, yeah, Toronto, but how did you know? And Roland leans in, stating that he grew up here, so he's got a certain kind of kinship with anyone from here, and he doesn't like him much at all. The man tells him, yeah, whatever, but then he loses a hand. Roland flips open his jacket, and he tells the receiver, come and get him, and then suddenly the man is dragged off by the staff members. Moments later, the two men throw the man into a room and Roland tells him that he could tell that he had been counting cards. Nothing distracts a man like a little unprovoked aggression, huh? As Roland takes another puff from his cigarette, the two bouncers call it, attention, he comes. He wears socks of the red panda skin. His cufflinks are made of the finest Argello horn. He is Tiger Shark. As the door is open, Tiger Shark walks in. The men says that he is the majority owner of the Marcus Casino, and he would like to invite the two of them to a special viewing of his aquarium. Meanwhile, at Sean Sung's apartment, Dick comes in through the window asking, so, <laughs> what's with all the romance? She tells him that she was going to surprise him, but she fell kind of asleep, you know? Just wanted to give him some good luck for tomorrow's interview. As Sean helps Dick with his shirt, Dick says, actually, the second hand is still getting high-tech weapons into Bloodhaven. I need to find out who that is. She takes off his mask, stating, you can be Nightwing anywhere. How about you be Dick Grayson for once? Dick thinks back to when Barbara told him that he went through hell to get his identity back. Why not focus on being Dick Grayson? And he tells her that he's going to go to the interview, though he's a little rusty. She can help him with his interpersonal skills, can't she? Back with Roland, he looks at Tiger Shark's giant tank, and he says that he's got some nice things in there. Seconds later, the man cheating from before is thrown into the tank. Tank, and Tiger Shark says that he's got something big coming up. The biggest thing this second-rate town's ever seen. He then grabs Roland by the shoulders and tells him, I've been watching you. Walking the floor is beneath you. You're a predator. 
A hunter. One who has evolved perfectly for your environment. A group of sharks then swim up to the man and they begin to eat him, turning him into chum. The tiger shark goes on stating, I would like to offer you to search Bloodhaven and find Nightwing and bring me back his skin. Later that night, Dick begins to head out on patrol when someone calls out to him from the rooftops. He turns and Blockbuster appears, punching him down. Dick quickly recovers after hitting them, and then as he begins to fight Blockbuster, Blockbuster continues to counter his hits and then headbutts him into a wall. Dick's body smacks into it and Blockbuster takes out a small squirter and he sprays a drop into his mouth stating, I'm not here to kill you. Before Dick can ask who, Roland reverts back to normal and he tells him, My name is Roland Desmond. Mark was my brother, and I'd like to offer you a job. Long ago, back in Dick's Robin days, Mark Desmond was the original blockbuster. He was a chemist and a smart one of that until he made a concoction that increased his strength. The smarts left him and he became very aggressive and easy to manipulate, especially from his own brother. However, there was a point when Roland had betrayed his brother and he was taken in. Afterwards, Roland came back stricken with guilt and he wanted to do something good, so he picked up where his brother left off with the concoction. As Roland finishes his story, he reaches down to Dick telling him, So, are you gonna take my hand or make me look like a putz? Dick, of course, takes his hand and he asks, How are you able to control the blockbuster transformation? And Roland says, Before Mark got hauled off, he developed a new version of the muscle juice. Let you keep your brains, which is nice, because you're gonna need it if you want to take down this tiger shark guy. Dick questions him and Roland says, Yeah, he's a smuggler straight out of Gotham, specialized in rare animal products. And now he's using my casino to launder money from sales of illegal high-tech weapons from the second hand. The more Roland talks, the angrier he gets, reverting back to Blockbuster. And after another drop, he reverts back, stating, That's why I need you. I'm losing control. Roland then hands over a piece of paper, stating that these are the names of the Harbor Police under their payroll. With his prior history, no one's going to believe him. Dick Grayson takes the paper and he says, You're right. Why should I trust you? And Roland goes on telling him how some of the shark's gear is spilling into the streets of the poorest neighborhoods. His city is getting used and people are dying, and this is just the beginning. Over the radio, Dick listens into the police report of violence at the mall, and he tells Roland, and that he's got to get going. As Dick swings by, Roland yells, It's happening, isn't it? It's up to us! We're the only ones who can stop this! Over at the mall, the two men begin running and one asks, where did they get that thing? And the other man says that some guy told him it fell off the back of a truck. He thought it was one of those love dolls. An android jumps down before the men, holding out her arm, charging the blaster in her palm. And the second man shouts, come on, switch to love mode, switch to love mode. As the android fires, Dick swings in, grabbing him, and he tells him, run, don't ever buy strange robots again. Dick jumps back up, fighting the android, but her advanced processor allows her to dodge all of his attacks, easily knocking him to the ground. He looks up, stating, maybe I I need to spruce up the resume a bit. And then he notices the forklift. He jumps on it and drives the forklift into the android, skewering her into the warehouse wall. A voice then asks, what the hell are you looking at? And a detective Elise runs out of her police car with her gun drawn. Dick tells her that that is an algorithm model war droid. Serious military hardware. Like this is being brought into Bloodhaven and a source says that some of the cops are helping with that. She takes the paper from him and begins to read the names of the supposedly dirty cops. And Dick asks her if any of these people could in fact be dirty. She thinks on it says, let's see. That's none of your damn business. She heads to her car and Dick shouts, come on, you owe me from the James Nice case. And Elise snaps back and I'm telling him, what? You think we're equals or something? You come to my town, do my job for free, get in my way, and you face no consequences? I don't owe you anything. So get out of here before people start to see us together. The next morning, while Sean is at work, she finishes up a call regarding most of her money for the community center being taken away. And the voice tells her that it must be nice to come back, right? Sean gets up hugging Dick and asks, so is she dating a sexy longshoreman yet? And Dick tells her, actually, he didn't get to the interview. She yells at him, telling him he had one measly job interview. And Dick says, why are you so focused that I need to something to keep me here? As Sean walks off, she says that things have changed. Ever since they got back from Egypt and them finding out that she wasn't pregnant, she thought that he was disappointed, but it seems like he was relieved. Dick gets up telling her that one of the things that made him fall in love with her is that he could be honest. And another is that she knows exactly who she is, who she was. But he can see that that anger inside of her still defines her. The pregnancy made him realize that he wouldn't want his child growing up driven by tragedy or anger. And while he would teach them not to do that, he fears that she would have the opposite effect. Dick hugs Sean and he tells her he just doesn't want to lie. They can work this out, but he has to go. It's important. He leaves and Sean's phone rings and the operator asks if she would like to accept a call from the black mate prison inmate, Beatrice Butler. She wipes a tear from her eye. She says yes. And as the call connects, she says, hey, pigeon. Back with Dick, he follows the lead on the dirty cops back to the pickup site along the coast. But before he has a chance to do anything, Skyhook swoops in, grabbing him, throwing him into the broken ship. He lands and then the lights come on and he's surrounded by villains. Roland then calls out to everyone who is interested in purchasing weapons from Tiger Shark. They can rid themselves of 
the superhero problem. In front of them, a superhero sample to test their weapons on. Roland leans out and he tells Dick, hey, thanks for taking that job for me. A few moments later, over in the other parts of town, Giz works away with his latest weapons when his phone begins to ring. He picks it up stating, hey, Nightwing. Yeah, I'm staying away from the computer like you told me a hundred times. Dick says, good, but that's not why I'm calling. Would you happen to have the blueprints for a Sea Phoenix 3000 luxury submarine? Not for any particular reason. Tiger Shard shouts at the villains, you let him escape, but I will give one of you free weapons if you can bring me his masked head. While many of the villains are now chasing Dick, Giz calls back, Giz the blue cheese. And Dick says, call me Nightwing. I already have a code name. Giz tells him, right. Well, I got your blueprints. Here's the escape capsule on deck three. So Dick charges through the underground men, Shrado and his boss, China White, Snake Pit, until he finally gets ahead to find Clock King in the middle of stealing things. Clock King shouts, wait, I must have it. And Dick tackles him to the ground just as the arrows are shot into the room. As Clock King gets back up and runs, Shadow appears pulling out more of the arrows. And Dick jumps on her and headbutts her. Still a bit dazed from the hit, Dick doesn't have a chance to fight back as Magog picks him up and throws him across the room. He gets back up, but Magog then punches him back down into the skeletal display. He continues to attack, and Dick blocks the hit, and then he grabs one of the bones with his feet, and he sticks it right into Magog's eye. Magog's energy begins to lose control, and he shoots Dick into the wall and out into another room. Kid Amazo then steps up, and just before he can attack, he's blasted away into another room. Dick gets up huffing while holding Magog's staff, and then he promptly passes out. After a few moments, he manages to pick himself back up and walk towards the escape pods when another voice tells him, nice work. Rather than opening the hatch, Roland punches right through it and Dick sighs, fine, let's do this. Roland laughs, telling him, no, no, you misunderstand. The thing is, you've already lost the war and like any good war, it's going to end in a bomb. Roland pulls off a plate, revealing a bomb and it's already counting down. Roland then pulls out the solution to change him back and he says, I'm going to defuse it. And Dick asks, why are you doing this? Dick gets back to work on the bomb and Roland steps into one of the capsules telling him, what I said about this place being used was true. However, then some guy shows up acting like he loves this place, like he grew up in it. The only one who could save the city is going to be Roland Desmond. Giz radios back asking if everything is okay and if Nightwing is all right. And as Dick is watching the countdown happen, he tells Giz to tell Sean that he, Cthulhu, and before Dick could finish, the submarine explodes. However, what Giz didn't see or hear was that three seconds before the explosion, Dick had spotted Clock King wearing the same suit the time bomb was wearing. He grabs him, telling him, make room, and as the bomb goes off, Clock King, of course, froze it. Once the explosion stopped, Dick says that they have to go rescue everyone, and of course, Clock King tells him, no, no, son. The vest only has a limited charge, and if we exceed it, it will drain us, which is why Tiger Shark wouldn't touch it. What happened to Time Bomb when we removed the vest is that he lost molecular cohesion, and he crumbled to dust. He had to be vacuumed up. But while Clock King is looking away, Dick pats him on the shoulder, telling him that no one dies on his watch. Clock King looks at his watch, and he sighs, and he takes off his glasses, stating, these are antique frames passed down from my grandfather. Dick punches into him, and when he wakes up, Clock King finds himself, along with all the other villains, safely floating out to sea. Tiger Shark shouts that they need to get back onto his ship, and seconds later, that explodes! Meanwhile, Dick opens his eyes up to see Sean next to him, and he begins telling her that he's sorry about how he treated her, and... But she stops him, telling him to just kiss her. And then he opens his eyes and sees Elise. He quickly pulls away, and Elise tells him that he could be a little happier to see her. She did just drag his ass out of the bay. And he asks, what about the vest? She points back, stating that that sparking burned up thing over there. Next time, wear floaties. Dick gets back up and he looks out at the ocean asking what happened to all of the people in the super criminals. And she tells him that the ones without a wanted poster are on their way back home. The rest are on the run. If she hadn't rescued him, maybe she would have gotten a few of them captured. She lights up her cigar and says, part of this is her fault. He asked her for some info and instead of looking into it, she just got all kinds of pissed. But that's what he needed, right? Dick tells her he couldn't trust his source, but he can trust that she hates him. And then Dick realizes that, that means that Tiger Shark is still out there. So he runs to the jet ski shouting that she owes him for almost getting him killed. She yells back, how? She saved his life. She can still taste his damn lips. And back at the Marcus Casino, Tiger Shark storms into his back offices and inside, Roland says nothing distracts a man like a little unprovoked aggression. And now he would like the casino and him out of town. Tiger Shark scoffs, hitting a switch, telling him that he is right where he wants him. The second hand wanted to give him a little token of their appreciation, but he was never all into that exotic alien weapon crap. Just then two literal Tiger Sharks claw their way out of the underground hatch and they begin eating at the guards. Roland looks back telling him, yeah, I grew up in the streets of Bloodhaven. Ain't many environments tougher than that. Roland transforms and he begins to beat up the Tiger Sharks and after bashing one into the ground, he takes the second one, ripping open his jaw. Tiger Shark begins to run for the door and then a headless Tiger Shark is thrown into his path. Roland walks up to Tiger Shark telling him, that's one thing. If you wanted to win, you're gonna have to get your own skin into the game. Later, Dick pulls up to the docks and he runs into the casino shouting for Roland. From behind the bar, Roland tells him, night work back here. Come and sit and enjoy the drinks on the house from the big winner. Dick takes 
takes a seat and Roland makes the cocktail and he says, after all of that, the second hand will want to be a bit more conservative on who they make their sales with and aim for a higher caliber of customer. They're going to need someone who's a smart, controlled businessman who knows the city like a native. Someone who can remind their clients that they need the latest technology to protect them from the Bloodhaven boogeyman known as Nightwing. So cheers to that. And if you would see yourself out, there's a lot of transitional paperwork left by the previous owner. Dick tells Roland, wait, something he should know. He's going to beat him because he knows him. Roland asks, how's that? And as Dick goes on, he tells him, you may have convinced yourself that you care about this city, that you're the hero that it needs. But the truth is, it was never about guilt. You didn't come back here because of what happened to your brother. You took the serum because you were alone and scared and to prove that you weren't weaker than your little brother. Rolla spins back, bashing the bar top and Dick smiles and Roland tells him, get out of my sight. Meanwhile, back at Giz's place, Mouse asks, so you're not a stripper. And Giggs says that this is even sexier. He's been helping Nightwing with tech support and also looking into some interesting stuff with the second hand. Mouse tells him to be careful and Giz says, don't worry, to catch this ghost in the machine, we're gonna need to be a ghost. But what Giz doesn't see is that there is someone watching him and over at Sean's apartment, Dick arrives and he hugs her, telling her, that he just needs to, but she stops telling him that she's sorry. She asked him to give her some assurance that he would in fact keep his feet on the ground, that he would be the thing that she always loved, him. But he wouldn't give her that, and instead he got scared of what could happen. He asked her to change, and she isn't running from who she was, not even for him. Dick shouts that he knows that what he said was messed up, but they can fix this, and Sean yells back, no, there isn't anything to fix. Stop trying to swing in and save this. It's over between us. There's nothing left to save. As Dick leaves, Sean shuts the curtains and sits on her bed, and Beatrice walks in stating that she always thought that her paintings were an extension of who she was. It's time for her to paint again, for both of them to fly. Some time passes and Dick did end up getting a job at the Marcus Casino as a dealer. As Roland walks by, he tells Dick, you're good at your job. I've got my eye on you, kid. But during that, at Mouse and Giz's apartment, Mouse walks in shouting for Giz to help bring in this stuff. She then sees Goob run up to her with his bloody paws. She runs to Giz's room to find Giz bloody laying at his computer and the weapon that he was working on stating, access denied. As the moon rises over Bloodhaven, one can see all of the inner workings of the city. You can see the families gathering on the patios for the night of eating, the black market dealings going on in the alleyways, and the dancing in port parks. All of these things can keep a person busy, but tonight, Dick has to remain focused on the bigger issue. As a Cobra agent shouts chaos for Kali Yuga, he is punched in the face and Dick begins to take out the rest of the Cobra lance heads. The question is why a cult dedicated to washing away the world in a wave of discord would rob a fundraising ball for a Bloodhaven politician? The correct answer is they wouldn't. That's when the reasoning behind it begins to sink in. Someone else is behind this. Dick feared this day for months after he learned that he got out of prison. Raptor. The individual who said that Batman was doing it wrong and had trained Dick Grayson wrong. The individual who claimed to be better than Batman. Raptor once helped Nightwing bring down the Parliament of Owls. He was his partner and even a mentor. But when he tried to kill Bruce for taking Dick Grayson away from the circle and putting him into a life of privilege, he turned into one of the most dangerous enemies that Nightwing has ever faced. As Raptor swipes at the politician, Dick dives in, taking the hit to push the politician out of the way. Raptor stands back up, stating that he was waiting to see if he changed. Thought maybe giving him a little more time to follow his lead. But here he is, saving another trust fund baby power fiend in a designer suit. Raptor turns firing a hook from his gauntlet into a waitress on the second floor, pulling it back, causing her to fall off. Dick runs in to catch the woman, just as Raptor expected. However, as Dick turns back, Raptor is gone. Later that night, Dick and Elena kiss under the moonlight, and they stop with her stating that she can tell that he's not all here. Dick says that he's sorry. He covered 20 blocks, and Raptor just disappeared. He's definitely up to something. And Elena tells him, more thievery, she suspects. But he's not anything special, just another gangster. Go out and stop him. That way you can come back to Gotham. Dick looks down, stating that she knows how he feels about that. And Helena says, yeah, yeah, this Bloodhaven needs Nightwing thing. But she puts herself fully into everything that she does, whether it's being a spy, a superhero, or his lover. Down on the street, Detective Elise shouts, Hey, tights, you think I'm going to be digging in the tracks to find you? You're nuts. Helena then gets up and tells Dick that she will not be second to anyone or anything. Dick jumps down and tells Elise thanks for meeting him, but she says don't get used to it. After her two men got busted for helping out Tiger Shark, internal affairs started cracking down on her whole department. Assisting a vigilante is just the kind of thing that they're looking for. That and after their little kiss when she pulled him out of the bay, it messed with her head and marriage. She turns to leave and says that she knows he's a little warm for her form, but the less that she sees of his cute bod, the better. So for now, he's on his own. 
So without having any ears around the town through the police, Dick turns to the only other people that he can trust, the runoffs. As he jumps down in front of the community center where Sean holds her meetings, he finds everyone standing outside. Stallion tells him that the ex-supervillains of Gotham club meeting has been canceled. It might be a permanent thing, so why doesn't he just skedaddle? Dick says, please, I'm sorry how things have gotten. I wish that I didn't have to do this, but I need some eyes on the street and could have used your help. Stallion pushes her way up, yelling, If you don't remember, our friend Giz got killed helping you. And Dick tells him, Giz went out on his own, and I have to live with that, but... Stallion pulls back, punching into the ground, telling Dick, I said skedaddle! We quit being villains because it ruined our lives. So then we tried to be heroes, and we lose our lives. So best get on with it. Dick gets up, dusts himself off, and says he's right. He needs them to leave, run off to somewhere else. As Dick leaves, he begins to head towards the place that he wished he didn't have to go. Because this person can help. He makes his way into the casino and he fights his way through the guards and just as the last one falls, Roland Desmond steps out. Dick tells him that he needs his connections and his knowledge. If he helps him find and stop a man called Raptor, Dick Grayson will leave Bloodhaven forever. The next day, Roland gets ready to speak in front of a group of local officials at Bloodhaven about how he wants to help change their city for the better. And just as he's about to take the stage, Raptor appears, slamming his face into the mirror, stating that he's going to show everyone how fake he really is. Roland shouts, Raptor? And Raptor throws him through the glass, stating, It looks like Nightwing's been telling his tales again. That's just something Nightwing would do. Use any method, even crawling to an underworld boss like Blockbuster just for help. Raptor then attaches a wire around Roland's neck and he begins to fire it over a statue before the officials. Raptor heads to the podium and shouts, You've all been conned by this man! He would want you to think that he's a self-made man pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. The lion pulls back, lifting Roland into the air, and Raptor goes on telling him, I'm gonna show you that this man is just like everyone else trying to get ahead. What if I could show you the beast deep down inside? Just then, Roland begins to let Blockbuster out, and he charges at Raptor, and as Raptor dodges the attack, he hits Roland with a mist, stunning him, stating, That's it. Show everyone what it really means to be the king of Bloodhaven. Roland shouts out in pain, but as his eyesight comes back, he sees Raptor is already gone. Roland then says, I just wanted to talk to the kids, so they have something to aim for. Meanwhile, over at Blue Blood Labs and Chemical Transport, scientists work with the local fishers at extracting horseshoe crab blood and making vaccines. But just then, Avery's voice calls out that she can't believe she's saying this, but they don't want their money. They just want the blue stuff. One of the fishers yells, Like hell! I got up with a butt crack at dawn to pick up these critters. You can go get your own. Avery points her gun at the fisher, asking, How about a mix of a little purple into that stuff then? And another voice asks, How about nah? And Dick throws a baton, knocking the gun out of her hand. As Helena gets ready to fire her crossbow, Dick says, Do I really have to say it? And Helena tells him, No. She knows that he prefers her Bloodhaven scum served up alive, so she can't kill them. It's all they ever talk about when they're engaged in other business. Dick grabs two of the horseshoe crabs and cracks them between one of the Whale Ender's men and then puts them back, stating, Thanks, fellas. Behind some barrels, Avery slams a syringe into one of the barrels, stating that if the Enders want to keep being players in Bloodhaven, they're going to have to level up. Dick calls out to Avery to just come out, and she tells him no, and her voice begins to change. She lunges out after sticking herself with a syringe, and as she jumps, she misses and falls flat on the floor. Dick looks over at the other men with Avery, asking, You too? And he puts his hands up, telling him, Oh, hell no. A short while later, Roland gets a call from Dick stating that his tip was right, but it wasn't Raptor. Laying out subtle clues really isn't his thing. Roland tells him, no, it's not. He was here and he forced my hand in front of the children. They saw a blockbuster. What the hell did you bring into this city? But before Dick could answer, Helena says, Roland Desmond. How disgusting. Dick turns back stating, wait, you've been listening to my conversation? And Helena tells him, of course she was. Dick sighs stating, after all of this, you still don't trust me. And Helena tells him, no. She doesn't. That would be stupid. Unlike him, she learned to never trust anyone other than God. Dick tells her, look, I don't trust Desmond. I'm just using my resources since we both share a common interest in helping Bloodhaven. Helena grabs Dick and smiles, telling him, you poor sweet boy, and then knees him in the stomach, telling him, this is for having me take on the Whale Enders gang on a mobster tip. She then punches him to the ground, and Dick gets up asking, what was the second one for? And she tells him that he allowed her to open herself up and feel comfortable. He left her vulnerable, letting her trust him. That was a lesson that he taught her. Never let your guard down. Later that night, Dick gets ready for his shift at the casino, trying to figure out what he should be doing next. He listens in on Roland's conversation with one of his men as they offer to take out those kids who saw him. Roland tells him that he better not lay a hair on them. Do whatever it takes, put them through college, whatever they need. Dick then takes out the earpiece, thinking, At least he was right that Blockbuster does have some moral code. But then a man clears his throat and Dick says that he's sorry. And the man tells him, No problem. Here's ten grand. Raptor pulls his glasses down and tells Dick, Go ahead and deal me in.
Raptor then says, You know, I was gonna teach you what you'd forgotten and bring you back to the world you've been taken from, but you abandoned me too. You broke my bones just like the floor broke my mother's. Now here we are. You could try and stop me here. Leap over the table, snap me into pieces, but then Roland would see your hand and know that you're secretly Nightwing. A waitress jumps up from the table, offering a Raptor a drink, and he laughs, telling her, ha no thanks, the hard stuff makes me crazy. Dick flips his cards and says, congratulations, sir, you win that round. Meanwhile, over at the home of Beatrice Butler, otherwise known as the Pigeon, she runs off to begin her own investigation. Sean finds one of Raptor's masks lying around and says that Pigeon tested her to see if she would join their fight. So whatever Pigeon is up to, she's in this. But this isn't their fight. They can all get out now. Gooper the Squirrel jumps off of Mouse's shoulder and onto the laptop, starting to type. As information about Nightwing appears on the screen, Mouse says that when Nightwing asked for the runoff's help, Giz jumped at the chance. He saved lives and didn't die a villain. Everyone gathers around and each one says, for Giz. Back at the casino, Raptor points out into the crowd, telling Dick, look what you traded in for. You traded Bruce Wayne for Bloodhaven, a city of the guilty. Once again, you bet against your own people, your own history, your own mother. Dick begins shuffling up a new deck and he says, my mother came to you when she needed help, helped steal treatment for leprosy. She was an angel to you, so you promised to protect her even after she started to go by the name Mary and built a life with my father. You continued to do so from the shadows because you were a wanted man, but you followed her and traveled the world only a few steps behind. Ever since we first fought, I've been trying to piece together my childhood to remember you, interviewing people from back then, and here's the theory that I came up with. That night, before the Flying Graces went on stage, you sat back watching the performers get ready. You had already given up being Mr. Numb by then, and you always felt a pang of envy because you weren't joining them on the stage. But then, you saw something strange, a new guy arguing with the ringmaster. Something was off. However, that's also when the crowd started to come in, and that's when you saw Bruce Wayne. As the night went on, you would watch from underneath the bleachers to make sure that Mary's performance went as planned, except you got distracted. In front of you was Bruce Wayne. It was Mary's birthday, and you figured why not get her something nice, something nicer than my father would have gotten her. But then, that's when the dry thud could be heard, followed by the screams. Everyone lost a piece of themselves that night, but you, you weren't the guardian anymore. You were just another petty thief, Raptor. So a new brand was built, took pieces of half a dozen superhero costumes, all to convince yourself that you weren't a bad guy. And that's when you built a metal glove and named it after the Romani wizard, Sukala, chained to a rock to prevent himself from destroying the world. You blamed Bruce Wayne, the rich, even me. Anything to avoid blaming yourself. And as Dick flips his cards, he says, dealer wins. Raptor sits in silence for a moment, but his look of sadness fades and he begins to laugh. He smacks the chips off the table, yelling, Nice detective work! Better than Batman, but it doesn't change a thing. Just then, some of the people begin to scream in pain as their muscles start to grow. Raptor then whispers that he gave the people what they needed to cure what ails them. Now, they can be themselves, Dick Grayson. Over at the Wales End neighborhood, Thrill pulls up with Mouse as Sean touches down, stating that he remembers this place. His parents used to bring him here. And as the three walk in, Sean says that it was closed when the factories left the neighborhood. The Whale Enders gang has been squatting here for years, but what they came for is the lab. Mouse looks around, stating that this place is like new. Before Gracie came to Bloodhaven, she was a biochemist at the Gotham Aquarium. A voice then says, yeah, it was messing around a place like this that turned her into Orca. Gracie gets up from leaning on a wall, stating that Whale's Enders are done. They tried to replicate her experiment, and right now she's not in the mood for a house call. So get out. Sean chases after her, yelling, wait. Bloodhaven is under attack, and we just learned the people are being turned into monsters. You were one of us once. Gracie turns back, yelling, stop. This isn't a runoff's meeting. She's got nothing to share with them. Sean shouts to the group that she said herself that she would follow anyone who would accept her. So when the whale enders came to ask her to make the chemical that changed her, she didn't. Because if she did, then they wouldn't need a bodyguard with the strength of a killer whale. They wouldn't need her. Mouse holds up Pigeon's laptop, stating that Raptor and Pigeon want to tear Bloodhaven into the ground. They're going to use their own citizens to do it. She can read the code, but not the formulas. They need her. They need Gracie Ballin. They need Orca. Back in the casino, Stalin and Grimm arrive to see Raptor making his escape with Pigeon. But inside, everyone is turning into blockbuster monsters, forcing Dick to suit up as Nightwing. While the chaos breaks out on the floor, one of the dealers begins to pick up the chips to cash in. But just before she can get the last chip, Dick runs through, grabbing her just as the table is thrown at her. The dealer stops Dick, shouting, Hey! Those are mine! Back off! But as she goes on yelling, her tone changes, and she begins to grow in size. But before she could fully transform, Roland charges through punching her, saving Dick Grayson. Dick tells him, Wait! You could hurt her! And Roland says, No, I'm not. She's an employee and a friend. 
but you, you're just a tourist. Roland spins back around, grabbing Dick, shouting, You were awful quick to get here, Nightwing. We made a deal to stop Raptor. Have you been spying on me? Dick asks him, What has he done? Look around. We gotta get all of the non-drinkers to safety. Everyone else has been turned into monsters because of contaminated cocktails. And as Roland lets go, Dick says, Where the hell did Raptor get some blockbuster serum anyway? And Roland says, All right, all right. Without weapons from the second hand, we were at a disadvantage. With all of the other bosses starting to look towards Bloodhaven, I had a couple of scientists take a sample of my blood so that they could make the serum available for mass production. We took out the parts that let them keep their smarts so that they could just focus on the parts that gave you power and rage. It's only going to be sold to the bosses who needed it so that we could level the playing field a little and then sell them the antidote for a higher price. But before I could get out the shipments, that thieving stalker took them. The two continue to fight the blockbuster horde and Dick then asks, what about the antidote? And Roland tells him Raptor burned it. The psycho is all on me. It makes this situation just as much on you. Just then, one of Roland's employees calls to him, stating that they have a problem. Some of the roided freaks are getting out into the streets. And just as they do, Stallion and Grimm show up, knocking them out. And he says, actually, there's been an update. A gorilla and a cowboy are fighting off the critters. As Dick follows Roland to the elevators, he says that they need to get outside and help those two. And Roland tells him, first, we have to get to the 17th floor and initiate a full bomb scare lockdown so that no more of these things get out. You go help out the ex-villains. You can trust me, just like you trusted me with the whole tiger shark thing. The elevator door opens up, and Dick says that Grimm and Stallion can hold their own for now. As the two get in, Roland begins to take his antidote, and Dick realizes he can't be blockbuster for extended periods. It hurts. And that's when a twisted voice says, So thirsty, dry and caged. Roland then tells him, I'm pretty sure we met before. Remember tiger shark? Just then, the top of the elevator is ripped off by a giant tiger shark who says, I drink all the tasty blood. Over on the nearby building, Pigeon begins bringing up the last of the crate, stating that it's almost time. His beautiful masterpiece will come to fruition, and anyone who tries to stop them in this failed city will either be broken or dead. Raptor then grits his teeth, stating that he couldn't do it. When it came time, he couldn't kill Nightwing. I had him. I showed him how he'd lost the long game, how he'd learned so damn little, but his eyes, he's got his mother's eyes. Pigeon then tells him that when he found her rotting at a prison and wrote her about her work, it wasn't just a mutual condemnation of a sick world that drew her to him. They had a shared pain. To face her took her heart and future just as Nightwing took his. They will end Nightwing together. Back in the elevator, Tiger Shark makes his way in and Dick then asks, I thought Tiger Shark had skipped town. And Roland asks, did you really think that I would let this crazy freak walk free? Tiger Shark punches into the side of the elevator, causing the lines holding it to snap. The elevator begins to fall as Dick jumps out, catching himself while catching Roland. And Roland tells him, look, just so you know, this changes nothing. We have a deal. While Tiger Shark begins to climb up the shaft, Dick begins to swing back and forth, allowing him to throw Roland up to the open elevator door. Roland then heads down the hall, calling out to the security guard on shift. And when he finds him, he sees his throat has already been slit. Back with Dick, he tries to maneuver around to avoid Tiger Shark. But as Dick kicks off, Tiger Shark bites right into his leg. Using Tiger Shark as a platform, Dick kicks off of him and up into the opening. Dick then shouts to Roland to hit the switch, and as Roland hovers his finger over the button, he begins to pull back. Tiger Shark lunges up, but at the last second, the door slams shut. Dick then rolls back, stating that he thought that he didn't want to talk to him, and Roland then asks, Did you get hit in the head too hard or something? And Dick tells him, Be quiet. I'm on the phone. On the other line, Sean says that she tends to get over bad breakups when things get a little crazy. And if their enemies can get it together to face her a Nightwing, better do it as well. Pigeon is working with Raptor. Mouse was able to get into Pigeon's computer and they found out that the casino is just a distraction. They're going to poison the entire city. They have canisters planted all over, hidden in plain sight. And Roland then asks, what is it? And Dick tells him that they're sending a final message on night wings. As the two look out, they see a swarm of birds flying their way, all with small canisters with a blockbuster serum around their neck. Back outside, Stallion holds down a mutated man and asks, so what are we doing here? And Sean flies down telling him that she needs him to prime them up so that she can carry the antidote without any issues. As the paint cans on her legs light up, Sean starts to weave throughout the crowds, tagging everyone that she can. And then there's a rumble on the ground. Suddenly, Tiger Shark breaks out shouting, filled out a hole, now I make holes in you. Sean sighs and then pulls out a syringe loaded with the antidote and up on the roof of the casino, Raptor begins to think back to a time when he was spending time with Dick's mother, Mary. As he does, Pigeon asks if he's thinking about her again. And Raptor tries to explain, but Pigeon says that she did all of this for him, for us. So why can't I be the one that you're thinking about? However, before she can finish, she's hit in the back of the head and Roland says that all of these damn birds on his roof, shoot! Dick then runs past shouting to Raptor as he punches into him. Raptor spits out a tooth stating, I always let you live out of respect for your mother to teach you, but now I have nothing left to offer. He swipes slashing at Dick's chest and the two go back and forth, punching and tearing into each other as Dick takes 
takes a kick at him, Raptor grabs him by the face and spins him around. With one quick jab, Raptor lays into Dick's back, and over with Roland, he picks Pigeon up and throws her into the ground, stating that he can do this all day. Pigeon then says that he likes being the strong man, huh? And she sprays the blockbuster serum in his face. She gets back up telling him that since he's already got the serum in him, this should go extremely painful. She was the avatar of the Ishtar, the goddess of sacrifice. Cities are monuments. They must fall! And just then, Sean yells, hey! Monuments don't like you much either, and slams a statue strapped to the spray can down on top of her. Raptor sees Pigeon gets crushed and headbutts Dick off of him to go get to her. Sean hurries over to Dick, and as she checks on him, her phone begins to ring. She grabs it, stating, give me some good news. And after a few seconds, she begins to yell, hell yeah! She turns back to Dick, telling him that they did it. The runoffs came together and saved the people in the casino, and they came together to help Nightwing. Dick struggles and says, Raptor, he still has the trigger. And that's when Raptor smacks Sean out of the way, telling him, yes, I do! Dick jumps up screaming at Raptor, punching into him, shouting, You could have been a good man! You could have been the man that she thought you could have been! And suddenly there's another scream as Roland charges through, breaking the two apart. Roland falls to the ground, stating that he needs to get it under control, and Raptor laughs, telling him, With all that muscle, you still missed! Except Raptor's nose begins to bleed, and his visor cracks as he falls to the ground. He gets back up, telling Dick that he finally did it. He knows that they made a deal, but he's got a new idea. They can rule this city together. He can be the brother that he never had. Roland extends his arm. And Dick shakes it and then sticks him with one of Sean's antidotes. Dick tells him that that's the antidote to the blockbuster serum. Roland falls to the ground shouting, You played me and cheated! And Dick says, Yeah, guess I did learn a thing from Raptor. While Sean starts tying Roland up, Dick checks on Raptor while he lays mangled on the ground. Raptor says, You know what really gets me? It's not just that I wasn't there for Mary. It's that I was never there for you. Always in the shadows. One foot behind. You never knew who I was because I never let you. My real name is Richard. Raptor passes on and Sean hugs Dick from behind and Dick says that he missed her so much. She tells him that she loves him too, too much. Nightwing can call in to face her anytime, but Dick can never call on Sean. Lights begin to shine down from the police headquarters and before Dick knows it, Sean is already gone. A few weeks later, Dick gets ready to go out of patrol when he stops by the pier to see Elise. She hands him a cup of coffee stating that one of his old buddies just kidnapped a couple of radio pundits and threatened to show how the left and the right are just reflections of. Dick takes a sip of his coffee stating, Mr. Nice. Elise lights her cigarette up, stating that it looks like he picked up some new toys along the way. She would go with him, but he knows how her hubby gets. But, uh, think he can call in some help? And there you have it, the full story of Dick Grayson's origin to the Grayson storyline to the Nightwing Rebirth. Now, I really liked him as Grayson, and I really liked Nightwing Rebirth. They went in a different direction recently, and that's why I have not been covering it on the channel. I'm not a fan of Rick Grayson, and I'm honestly just waiting for that to resolve. So that's, that's where I'm at with Nightwing. But what do you think about Nightwing? Do you like Nightwing? He's such an odd character, and I personally really enjoy him, but not everyone does. So let me know what you think in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time right here at the Comic Storian channel. And don't forget, please consider going to our Twitter, subscribing to the channel, and hitting that bell for a notification.